Cary TV, the town of Cary's government access channel. I will call to order our March 16th meeting of the Cary Planning and Zoning Board. And we will begin by adopting our agenda. If there are no amendments, can we get a motion to adopt? I'll make that motion. We have I'll, a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. That's Mr. Evangelista and Mr. Uh, and Buck down here. You've met everybody, right? <laughs> um, being that there's no discussion, all those in favor of the motion to stay to say aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. And just to um, let everybody know in the audience, we're going to do things a little differently tonight because we have a new clerk for this board. She doesn't know us, so you're going to find me trying to repeat everybody's name after every motion or, or uh, a significant comment. Um, it's, it's not because we're going senile, we just are trying to make it a little easier. Okay, uh, next we have to approve our January 26th regular meeting minutes. Do we have any amendments? Nancy, Nancy Cadjo, a motion? Yes. A motion. Oh, you're making the motion, all right. To approve the minutes. Thank you. No. We have a motion. To I'll approve. second. We right. have a motion to second. Discussion? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. And that will bring us to the meat of our business. Um, we are going to start with several cases that require a public hearing. And so before we get into those cases, I'd like to provide a little bit of background on the public hearing process. Um, we will begin with a staff presentation that will happen at the uh, podium to my left to your right. Um, once that presentation is completed, I will open the public hearing and the first person to speak during the public hearing will be the applicant and they have 10 minutes to address the board. Um, after the applicant's presentation, I'll open uh, up the public hearing to any other uh, people wanting to make a comment. Um, we ask if you do want to make a comment, please, uh, there's cards that our clerk has that you can fill out that just tell us who you are, just to make sure we can properly uh, uh, amend the notes. Um, I will ask some speakers to come to the podium on my right to your left, and you're going to notice there's a little black box on that podium, and it's um, when you start, it's going to have a green light on it. That green light is going to be uh, on for three and a half minutes, or excuse me, four and a half minutes. At um, four and a half minutes, the green light will go out and an amber or yellow light is going to come on for 30 seconds. At the end of five minutes, a red light will come on. And at that point, I'm going to ask you to conclude your comments to be fair to other speakers. Um, I'm asking you to, uh, if you do uh, want to address this, please be concise. If there's multiple people that have the same perspective, please elect a spokesman. Um, we're pretty good listeners. Um, please respect the five-minute limit. And please direct your comments to the full board. 
and we will not interact with you. This is our opportunity to listen to you. So don't expect us to, don't ask us questions or expect us to respond to your comments. Um, once everyone has had a ch an opportunity to speak, I will close the public hearing and then we're going to uh, have an open board discussion where we can ask questions of the applicant and or the staff. And uh, we will follow that hopefully with a motion and a vote. And that being said, we're gonna uh, begin with case 14 REZ 29, which is the Orem property presented by Ms. Behrman. Good evening. This is a public hearing on a request to rezone about 26 acres at 1600 and 1720 High House Road. This is a vicinity map. The site is adjacent to the Bradford to the west. There's a subdivision to the north, a Georgetown subdivision, and then Prestonwood, the portion of the golf course is located a short distance to the east. The existing zoning on the property is R40. It's also in a mixed use overlay district. The mixed use overlay district previously corresponded or corresponds to a um, previous uh, community activity center that was uh, uh, included in the um, land use plan. Within the community activity center and the mixed use overlay district, uh, detached dwellings are allowed only as a special use and there's a minimum density of 3.5 units per acre. On um, February the 12th, uh, just recently, the town council did approve a land use plan amendment that removed the uh, community activity center designation from this property. So you may recall that you have seen this uh, particular case recently. Uh, this request is to rezone the site to um, the transitional residential conditional use district and also remove the um, mixed use overlay district that had uh, corresponded with the community activity center that was re uh, removed. There are also several zoning conditions proposed. Land use would be limited to detached dwellings and neighborhood recreation use. The maximum density would be 2.6 units per acre with the minimum lot size of 7,000 square feet. Also, since the public hearing before town council, the applicant has added an additional condition that the dwellings would be constructed with basement crawl space or an elevated slab. Since this condition was added uh, after the public hearing, this meeting is a public hearing for, um, to receive any additional comments that uh, citizens may have on that change. This is a land use plan. The site is in the low density residential area and then you can see the change in the boundary for the activity center. And then this just is a, a little bit uh, zoomed out version where you can see the entire activity center uh, as it stands now. There is, um, the site is impacted by stream buffers along the northern boundary of the site. Uh, these features will be field determined at the time of the site plan review or subdivision review. This shows the uh, site on the Carries Parks and Greenways plan. There is a proposed street side trail that would run along the opposite side of High House Road across from the property. According to Cary's transportation plan, High House Road is a major thoroughfare. Uh, there is an existing C-Tran uh, fixed route line along High House Road and a uh, future line uh, that would be uh, planned along Davis Drive. At the public hearing, uh, we did, uh, there were two speakers that spoke in support of the request. We did not receive any protest petitions. Uh, one of the speakers did express some concern with the potential for a street protect, uh, connection to Bridal Creek Drive, which is uh, in the Preston um, area adjacent to the east of the site. And uh, also with the hearing, council members did express, uh, generally express some support for removing the site from the activity center in the overlay district to allow the, uh, the lower density that's uh, represented by this request. That uh, concludes staff's presentation. will be uh, available for questions after the public hearing. Okay, at this point I'll open the public hearing and we will begin with a uh, um, 
some comments from the applicant. Hey, before you do that, I neglected to do something. I neglected to wish everybody a happy St. Patty's Day tomorrow. My Irish mother would have been furious with me had I missed that. So um, happy St. Patty's Day, everyone. And you've got a beautiful green tie on tonight. I have to. Like I said, I have an Irish mother. <laughs> Thank you. I um, apologize for that interruption. That was oh, totally no. out of order, but. You know what? It's, it's fine with me. Um, my name is Glenda Topp, and I'm with Glenda S. Topp and Associates, and I'm here tonight representing um, the property owners, the Orem family. Um, I will be brief. Um, as staff pointed out, um, the council did um, recommend approval of the land use plan amendment back in February. Um, our proposed rezoning complies now with the land use plan. With the zoning conditions, we are low-density residential. Um, due to a comment um, made at the public hearing, we added the condition um, concerning the type of foundation. Um, as you all know, um, this property um, is adjacent to the Bradford um, higher density residential and the non-residential to the west of the property, um, to the north and to the east is um, low density residential. We believe that the proposed use provides an excellent transition um, to the existing land uses. Um, we did get support from the um, uh, members or the actually the residents who attended the neighborhood meeting um, they wanted to see a lower intensity use um, they had issues with traffic congestion and the use that we're proposing we believe does um, present the least amount of traffic for that area um, we do believe the use um, is appropriate here and we ask for the board support and i am happy to answer any questions that you might have thank you very much this space, uh, at this point, we'll open up the public hearing to comments from anyone else that would care to address us. Anyone? Seeing no one approach, I will close the public hearing and open this case up for board questions. And I will point out, usually we're probably a little bit more inquisitive, but we just saw this case a month and a half ago and we dug into it in fairly deep detail, so there's not a lot of new news here. But in, in our defense, we, we have a pretty good idea what's going on here. Nancy, do you have something? I'm good, I agree. Oh. We dug, dug into it. <laughs> if there are no questions, then I'm gonna ask for a motion. I'll make a motion. We have a motion, please. Carla. Okay. Uh, I move that the board forward case number 14-REZ-29 to town council with a recommendation for approval as it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans and is reasonable and in the public interest, interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and presentation. We have a motion, do we have a second? I second a motion. We have a motion, we have a second discussion. No discussion? We like it. In that case, <laughs> they usually aren't this easy. In that case, I'm going to call it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries unanimously. And we're going to move on to our next case, which is 14 REZ32, which is the purse property um, presented by Ms. Granin. Thank you. This is a request for rezoning of approximately 73.5 acres located off of Luter Shop Road. Subject property is shown here highlighted in yellow. Portion of the property is located in Chatham County and a portion of the property is located in Wake County. The site is impacted by a stream buffer according to Kerry's GIS maps and field determination of such features will be required at the time of development plan review. Carries Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Resources Master Plan identifies the American Tobacco Trail, Greenway Trail, and the general vicinity of the subject property. There is no master plan for the subject property at this time that's in the works, um, nothing on paper yet. There has been some discussion with the applicant about ideas 
and the applicant has introduced some zoning conditions regarding greenways, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the comprehensive transportation plan identifies Morrisville Parkway as a major thoroughfare and um, White Oak Church Road as a thoroughfare in close proximity to the property. So just a small portion of the property is impacted by that with frontage on this thoroughfare. Cary's land use plan designation is a combination of both low density residential for the portion of the property in Chatham County and very uh, low conservation residential for the portion of the property that's in Wake County. The existing zoning is a combination of R1 in the Chatham County portion and Wake County R40 for the portion in Wake County. The applicant is proposing um, residential 40 conditional use. And in addition to that base zoning designation by being annexed into the town of Cary, uh, the Watershed Protection Overlay District, Jordan Lake Subdistrict, would also apply to both portions of the property. And the applicant is seeking the Conservation Residential Overlay District for the portion of the property that's located in Wake County. A uh, proposed zoning condition that the applicant presented at the town council meeting is that the use shall be limited to detached residential and neighborhood recreation. <coughs> property owners within 800 feet of the subject property were notified by mail. Um, the community was um, not eligible to submit a protest petition because the property is not in the ETJ and not in the town limits but we did want to record the feedback that we had from the community and neighboring property owners were concerned with the compatibility of the existing residential use and what was proposed in terms of lot size and buffers. There were comments about preservation of streams and creeks and the location of road connections to adjacent development. And this is an illustration of the Woodhall development that's in review to the north. This um, red arrow shows the approximate location of a stub road from this neighborhood to the Purse property, which is the subject of the rezoning. Um, the plan, as I stated, is still in review, but there was a good bit of discussion and concern about this. So just wanted you to be aware of the nature of that and what the concerns were about the close proximity of that road to some existing residential development off of Old Thompson Creek Road to the west. Since the town council public hearing, the applicant has proposed additional zoning conditions to add common open space along the western boundary and also to dedicate a 20-foot wide graded greenway easement to the town of Cary within a portion of that open space. And to help illustrate that, the applicant provided an exhibit um, that shows the overall um, property highlighted in red. And here's the Chatham Wake County property line, and then the area where the open space is provided. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that you can see a uh, portion of the open space is proposed to be uh, 40 feet wide. And then there's uh, a little further to the south, a portion of the open space proposed to be 60 feet wide. And within that 60 foot area, the applicant has proposed a 20 foot wide greenway easement, which would be graded to town standards. Again, as I mentioned, there's no master plan requirement for a greenway dedication. So this was a voluntary condition. Um, the applicant knew that there were long-term plans for greenway in the area. So this was something that they offered. This concludes staff's presentation. Uh, following the applicant's comments, I will be available for your questions. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to open the public hearing and ask the applicant to address us, please. Good evening again. Um, my name is Glenda Topp with Glenda S. Topp and Associates. Um, Ms. Grannon did an excellent job going over the proposed rezoning. I'm probably going to be a little bit redundant, but I just want to make sure that um, we present um, our proposal um, with the explanation of um, 
why we feel that this is appropriate for the property. Um, the request is to amend approximately 73.5 acres um, from R40 W in Wake County and R1 in Chatham County to R40 conditional use zoning. Um, approximately 29 acres is located in Chatham and 44 acres is located in Wake County. And because it's not in the ETJ, there is an owner initiated annexation accompanying the request. Um, we're also requesting that the um, portion of the property that's located in Wake County um, be brought into the conservation um, residential overlay district. Um, the property being considered tonight is regulated by two land use plans. Um, one is the Southwest Area Plan and that's for the portion in Wake County, and then the portion of the property that is in Chatham County is governed by the uh, joint chatham Cary land use plan. In the southeast, excuse me, in the southwest area plan, the designation for the subject property is very low conservation residential. Um, this um, VLCR requires that the use of the conservation overlay district and permits densities of up to 1.5 units per acre um, with the provisions that are in the ordinance that the amount of open space is provided. Um, under the Chatham County Joint Plan, um, the density is actually higher and it does permit densities up to two units per acre. And also under the low density, some non-residential um, uses are allowed. Um, with the zoning case, um, our uses are limited to um, detached residential. Um, our request is consistent with both the Southwest Area Plan and the Joint Carry Chatham Plan. Um, we believe that the proposed zoning classification is appropriate for the property. Um, again, under the R40 zoning district, the minimum lot size is 40,000 square feet unless a development comes in um, meeting the requirements of the conservation residential overlay district for the Wake County part and for the portion of the property in Chatham County under R40, the option does allow someone to come in with cluster development. Um, prior to the public hearing, um, we went out and met with um, two property owners who lived at the end of um, Old Thompson Creek Road um, in Chatham County. Uh, their lots abut our western property boundary. Um, they had several concerns, um, had some concerns about stormwater and stream preservation and also an appropriate transition between our proposed R40 zoning and the lots um, within their subdivision. Um, also at the public hearing, um, these two um, property, property owners also spoke and the same concerns were raised. And um, there was also a, several comments by council members concerning the road as Ms. Grannon showed on the map that is being proposed to the development adjacent to us and also looking at providing an appropriate transition between um, our zoning and the existing development. Um, that brings me to the point of the two conditions that we added, which are conditions number two and number three. Um, these two conditions address the transition between our proposed development and the, the existing lots. Um, for point of reference, I do wanna say that the LDO only requires a 20-foot landscape strip planted to a type B standard um, with our lot size and the lots off of Old Thompson Creek Road, and that um, 20 feet can be part of the lot. So that is what the LDO requires. So as Ms. Grannon pointed out, um, by our zoning conditions for two and three, we are providing um, consistently along our western, our western property boundary a 40-foot um, area of common open space. This area would be planted to a type B buffer. Um, in that 40 feet, um, it will not be part of the lots. It will be outside. It will be maintained by the Homeowners Association and um, uh, staff pointed out the activity that can occur within that 40 feet. 
Um, we did work with Parks and Recreation, even though there is not a plan specifically for this area. On a portion of our western boundary, the, the width is actually 60 feet, but 20 feet of that will have a greenway easement, and we did agree to, to grade that as part of our um, zoning conditions. Um, so what, what we have done, we have increased um, the space between the property line and where the lots can begin um, um, within our proposed development. So we, we are now exceeding what is, what is required under the, uh, uh, excuse me, the LVO. Just briefly, um, there was that issue um, with road connectivity. Um, it is shown on the Woodhull subdivision that is currently going through the town's review process. Um, it really doesn't have anything direct. I mean, it, obviously, the, the, the development is adjacent to us. But at this point, with our rezoning, we are at the zoning stage. Um, so um, we have not submitted a subdivision plan, so our, our plan does not show connectivity at this time. However, with our zoning conditions, there cannot be a road any closer than 40 feet um, to our property boundary. So that was how we um, dealt with providing a, a minimum distance between um, the property line and a road connection um, might occur. Uh, on our property, and it's also important to note, and again, staff did an excellent job with that slide showing that there is an existing stream that exists within 200 feet of the northwest property corner of our site that does limit how far any road can be placed. So there is a, a small window if a road is built where it can actually occur. I um, also want to point out that uh, in your staff report, there are some historic features um, on the Perth property. Um, the Yates Carpenter House, there's a barn and some accessory structures. Uh, Mr. Perth has chosen not to include that portion of the property in this rezoning. Um, it will remain as is on the site. I know there has been issues brought up before about what's happening with these old homes, but in this particular case, um, he's going to retain um, ownership of that property and those structures will, will remain um, on the site. In conclusion, the proposed rezoning complies with both the Southwest Area Plan and the chatham Carey Joint Land Use Plan. If the rezoning is approved, any development on the property will property will be required to comply with the R4 standards, which includes the requirements of the conservation overlay district or the cluster standards um, under R40. Um, also, we will be um, having to comply with the watershed protection overlay district, and we feel that um, complying with the R40 standards along with the zoning conditions being offered that the development or the rezoning and any development that would occur on the property would be compatible with the existing development um, surrounding the PERS property. Um, by going with R40 and the conservation overlay district or the cluster provision, um, it also provides environmentally, it provides the opportunity to protect environmentally sensitive areas, which is why that southwest area plan was designated for either very low or low density residential. Um, we believe that the site is best suited for the use and the zoning classification that we have proposed, and we would ask for the board support. I'm here to answer any questions, but also if there are more technical questions, the engineer that's working on the rezoning is also here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this point in time, we'll open the uh, public hearing up to other comments. Anyone else like to speak to us? Anyone? Seeing no one approaching the podium, I'm going to close this public hearing and open this case for board questions. Yeah. Ms. Sadler, you had your hand at first, I think. Um, I'm curious as to whether the, uh, the people who spoke at the public hearing um, was there any reaction from them, positive or negative, in response to the addition of a greenway and the 60-foot slash 40-foot buffer? 
I have not heard from them directly. I've heard from um, per heard from someone who's interested in purchasing the portion at the end of the cul-de-sac. So I've been in touch with that person's um, attorney, and they're just curious. So they they asked to see the exhibit. So we forwarded that to them, and uh, but we haven't heard any reaction from them about that. Okay. And the other question is, on this site. Are there portions that are not buildable, um, wetlands? That's going to be a site plan issue. Um, the GIS maps did not show any wetlands. They okay. did show a stream buffer. Okay. But we have not done field determination of that. That's something that will happen with the development plan. Buck, I think you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to really tag on to Carl's question and may not be answerable at this point, but given uh, the constraints on the site, Deborah, and, and the uh, density that's requested here, is do we have an idea of how many houses may ultimately be built here, some range? We don't know exactly, but based on the zoning um, conditions offered by the applicant, what you're looking at, um, Bear with me one second. I think we'd put a range in with our with our school data. Yeah, it's in seventy nine point five. Yeah. Yeah. Um, based on the density, we're looking at um, 78, 78 homes. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions. Uh, one more about White Oak Church Road. Um, how how long is that portion that they front White Oak Church Road? I know it was said in the public here uh, in the council meeting. But I can't remember. Yeah. What is the question? How, how what is the length of that? What is section? the length there? Um, I believe it's just about eighty. Is it the distance here? One hundred and fifty feet. Yeah, the width at White Oak Church Road. And so what they'll re be required to do is is some improvements on their side of White Oak. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the best I remember, no improvements were made for any of these other properties that were already built to the north, right? I travel that road sometimes. I don't remember it being. My concern here is there is an elementary school going in. And I just, it's, you know, unfortunate. There's nothing they can do here, but it's unfortunate that we're packing in 80 homes and there's practically no improvement to a two-lane road with no shoulders, no ditches, no sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just curious as to, um, you know, what the eventual future will be for White Oak because looks like significant portions are going to remain mm -hmm. just like that. Uh, good evening, Chairman and Board. Um, I'm Priyatam Khanna with the uh, Towns Transportation Department. Uh, currently, there, is, uh, there are two applications that are under review, uh, immediately north of this site as well as in the northeast direction, and they are proposing road widening along White Oak Church Road as well as uh, Morrisville Parkway. Okay. Okay. You mind if I piggyback as long as you're up at the podium anyway? Um, I'm going to ask a question that is clearly a site plan question, so you have no way of answering it, but I'm still going to raise it. Um, we like to have at least two points of access, road, points of road access for any development to, to facilitate public safety, vehicle access, you know, fire, police, et cetera. Um, it looks like there is one obvious point of access on White Oak Church Road. However, there doesn't look like there's any other obvious point of access. Um, is there anything in the plan or coming along that I can't see that would suggest that this concern is mitigated? Um, we have some language in LDO where it says for more than 100, uh, 100 or more uh, units, the site plan is required to provide two points of access. 
Okay. Whereas uh, the maximum, based on the maximum density, we can only have 78, 79 units. So they're not required to provide two points of access, but based on the connectivity ordinance, um, you can see the, the street stuff from Wood Hall, the site to the northwest, that's where it is coming into picture. So we'll, we'll learn more at site plan. Yes. Got it. Other questions? I have one, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in this buffer space that we're talking about, the 60 feet, there's a reference to a subdivision identification signage. A, re a reference to a what? A subdivision identification signage. Oh, right. No, just for example, um, let me just pull this slide up again. I think I know where <coughs> this is going, but could you elaborate? Sure. If the, if the road from the Woodall subdivision were to come in at you know, the northern point and they wanted to do some sort of an entry monument identifying their subdivision, that would be an opportunity to do and some sort would of Would that a, be on somebody's lot? Typically, it's not on a lot. It would be in common open space. Yeah, if there's a homeowners association, we certainly, with new development, try to make sure it's on common open space. So the sign would probably end up being in the greenway space or where the new road? Connects? Would have to be outside the greenway. It would have to be outside the greenway easement. The, with a stream buffer in this general vicinity, there's a little bit of you know uncertainty about, about exactly where that future greenway trail would go. Um, so that it's not proposed to be along this northern portion up here. But it's just making sure that um, the applicant wanted to make sure that they didn't um, limit opportunities for an entry monument, an entry sign coming into the neighborhood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. other One other question. Uh, the Greenway, mm -hmm. that's not on the Master Parks Plan, right? Correct. And so there's really no reason to believe it will ever connect to anything other than the general location of it was put in place following discussions with parks recreation and cultural resources to get it aligned um, with the neighborhood that's developing to the north where they are offering you know a greenway as well um, there's potential that there will be a greenway trail somewhere along the southern portion of the property None of that's been locked in yet, but um, right. it's it's close to where the town anticipates seeing seeing the greenways. Okay, looking at the slide though, it doesn't look like it extends to the northern property. Well, that um, that's not been finalized yet, and there was no zoning condition. Let me pull the greenway trail back up again. Actually, I'm well. I'm looking at the slide that you have up, mm -hmm. and it it shows the greenway stopping before it gets to the northern property. Right, the applicant has not offered a zoning condition to extend beyond that area. They they might at site plan do something, but they're in terms of what they're offering as a zoning condition at this point in time, um, because that was still a little bit uncertain. You need to know where exactly that stream is mm -hmm. before you decide where you're gonna put the the um, greenway trail you can't put you can't put the greenway trail um in the regulated buffer area it's got to so that's got to be identified first so they couldn't they couldn't really get that detailed with the zoning condition at this point about the location did you have something you wanted to add can i add to that mm -hmm. i'll try to clarify um on this slide but first of all you have to start i'm going to say my name my name is Ed Tan with Withers and Ravenel. I'm here representing the applicant, I'm the engineer working on the project with uh, Ms. Top. The answer, I think, to your question, the reason we, we didn't show the Greenway easement going all the way to the northern end, there's a stream buffer that runs diagonally across there, and the subdivision um, that was shown on the Woodhall subdivision slide. Can we go to that yeah, slide? Yeah, pull that up here. It's our understanding they have a proposed greenway that follows that stream that's outlined in blue there. And that would likely meander onto the purse property following the stream buffer, and then at some point connect 
to that green line on the previous slide, which is why we did not extend the greenway all the way to the north because it wouldn't fall outside that stream buffer. And so typically we follow the, the, the buffers to place those greenways in. So that, that may help explain the reason why. And one of the property owners that we had been discussing uh, the project with lives in the house that abuts that corner. And uh, he was the uh, property owner that had made s some comments and concerns about the road being connected that close to his property. So as, uh, as something to keep in mind with him, we were trying to move the road 40 feet, a minimum of 40 feet off of that property line to uh, try to work with him on that and also not put a greenway in addition to that uh, right behind his house. So that, those are some of the reasons why we uh, wrote the conditions as we did so that it followed the natural stream, but then working with staff, it would follow that outer edge of the western property line headed further south for a future connection to another greenway trail that uh, may be coming in, in when the uh, parks plan is updated showing what's going on out in the Chatham portion of the okay. master plan. Okay. So. so Thank you. Taking yes. that, I, so where this road is going, this stub road, it's going to follow along the greenway or it, no, the stub road is likely going to come across the stream if, if we can get it permitted at subdivision plan. The greenway will follow the blue streamline from the project that's under review to the north, and then it would basically cross that road at some point and then pick up on the other side of the road onto this, uh, the purse property, if that makes So the greenway would stay south of that stream, but the greenway would stay there? when the road comes in? I'm gonna use this okay, microphone, sure. so. If, this, if the road came in off of the Woodhall subdivision, it would probably likely curve like this to Thank get you, a perpendicular see. crossing. This greenway coming off of the Woodhall subdivision up here meanders and follows that and will probably cross the road at some point and then pick up on the other side of that road. Since we don't have a subdivision plan or a site plan, we don't know exactly where that trail will end up but it would likely end up somewhere within this blue stream buffer and then follow along and then cross back into that green area on the previous slide. Okay. So we were trying to keep this area clear of any kind of greenway or road uh, to work with this property owner here, so. Thank you. Other questions? Um, one more. <laughs> I keep saying one more, right? Um, <clears throat> so just, to make sure I understand, well, actually, I think I just found it. Minimum lot size could be 15,000 square feet. That depends, Using right, the cluster right. option, mm -hmm. right. Okay. Either the cluster or the conservation residential overlay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That was my Other last questions? question. Oh, I do still. Sorry. Please, nothing. So can we address the stream preservation of the stormwater drainage and uh, what are those considerations that were brought up? Um, what is the question? Well, I have to agree we are close to Jordan Lake over there and that is a I mean I don't know the exact terminology but how are we affecting the whole ecological area and the drain water and the that topic in terms of um, well they said one applicant had questions about stream preservation and stormwater drainage so I didn't know how their concerns were being addressed I think the applicant wants to speak to that. I, I think their concern was, are, are we preserving the streams, the natural streams? And we, we told them we have to because of the ordinances and the state regulations. So we are, at the time of subdivision plan approval, we have to meet the town's requirements and the LDO for stream buffers and preservation and meeting all the water quality practices that have to go into the subdivision plan. So that's how we propose on meeting those. And that was sufficient for the property owner when we met with them so that they understood we weren't just sending stormwater down into their backyards. We have to detain it, treat it, clean it, and then release it back in its natural drainage way, so. Okay, thank you. Nancy, if I could add one comment to that. I live in this area, as you could probably tell. Um, I would think that the concern is to make sure that there isn't any additional water 
coming onto the properties on Old Thompson Creek Road because I, they are all on um, sewer systems, private sewer systems. And in that property, in that area, you have to use alternative types. These sewer systems can cost thirty to fifty thousand dollars, and they you have to have usually about ten acres in order to accommodate that. And as you can understand, they're they're fairly fragile. They can take just so much that land does not drain. So additional water coming onto your property could be a real serious issue. So I, I suspect, I can't speak for the applicants, but I would think that that would have been one of the concerns. Any additional runoff onto those properties would, would cause some real issues that would impact everyone in the area. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? If I may, to, um, to address the comment that was just made, in the Southwest Area Plan, the designation is very low density, or very, very low density conservation. VLCR, however you say it, VLCR and the cluster re re requirements are basically the same as the VCL, VC, VCLR, mm -hmm. um, which are set up to require additional open space to help preserve the environmental integrity of the area. So by committing to develop either just straight R40 or um, the, the cluster or the conservation overlay disk requirements, you do have to set aside additional open space that, that does take into account that, those environmental issues. I mean, when, when the town adopted that Southwest Area Plan, it was for the lower densities to, to protect the environmental areas out in that part of um, both Wake County and Chatham County. Other questions? Seeing none, do we have a motion, please? Ch Chairman, I'll make a motion. <clears throat> I move the board forward case number 14 REZ 32 to the town council with recommendation for approval as it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans and is reasonable and in the public interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and presentation. We have a second. I'll second that. We have a second discussion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to vote against the motion. Um, there's a lot of things to like about this. Um, you know, they, they met the land use plan. They're doing the very low, um, now she's got me doing it, the VLCR requirements. Um, I, I know that a lot of these issues are site plan issues, and I'm sure, and it sounds like they're being addressed. But, uh, you know, in this area, people bought out here so that they wouldn't be close to dense development. And I still see the potential of having 15,000 square foot lots abutted to 10 acre lots. And a 40 foot buffer with a greenway is, is not going to make any difference. And in fact, putting a greenway along that buffer kind of adds insult to injury. We have a different perspective than most people, okay? So what you're basically doing is, is routing people, all of these new people, right along the property lines. So, you know, I'm going to, um, I would like to have seen something along the lines of a condition that said larger lot sizes would be put along that boundary or a much larger, you know, a hundred foot buffer that didn't have the greenway in it. Something along those lines, I can't recommend, you know, what they should say, but I have seen things like that offered in the past. Um, I'm still not seeing them here, so I, for that reason, I'm gonna vote against it. Oh, may I? Other I, comments? I would also like to see a larger lot size and a transition also, not just, like you said, a greenway that's putting the right, the traffic right where they did not wanna keep there. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, Todd percent. I think that, you know, development's happening here, but we have to do no harm. Well, obviously, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I support this uh, applicant on this uh, particular project. I really view this piece of property, uh, if you will, as, as like a large infill space uh, with development 
all around it. Granted, it is uh, some larger development, but given the, the fact that the applicant has uh, met the requirements for both the land use plans in, in uh, Wake County and Chatham County and, and the local ordinance, we're looking at, at R40 development, which provides a good transition um, in this area from both the larger properties as well as the, the more dense property uh, to the northwest uh, there. Um, I think that at some point in time we're going to see development and given the trends, the likelihood of very large or larger tracks coming in here is probably not going to happen. So I support the applicant in this. And I'd like to say that um, I seconded this because, as you've heard mentioned already, the, the land use plan was, was uh, addressed and met and, and the unique geography with, with one road uh, access was met. But what really strikes me is in one little corner of this property, we have neighbors who've been established. We have a new development coming in. We have a road stub we have to address. We have a stream buffer that pretty much trumps everything. Uh, greenway and a separation buffer and while many of these are are indeed site plan issues the zoning conditions are put forward to give as much assurance that those are going to all be met as as well as possible and and that's what these zoning conditions are all about in the first place so I, I'm really glad to have seen so much thought and and to hear how much went into the the thought process behind conditions aimed at just this one little corner to make sure that, that everybody's needs are met as well as possible at this stage. So for that reason, uh, I will support this. Other comments? Seeing none, I'm going to call this for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that motion carries uh, seven to two. With Nancy and Carla voting against. With right? Nancy and Carla being. Just to help. Here. Th thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> you need to remind me. Okay, we're now going to move to um, case um, 14 REZ 35, Amberley PDD amendment. Ms. Grennan. Thank you. This is a request for an amendment to a portion of the existing Amberley planned development district located at 2374 Yates Store Road on approximately 23.27 acres. Subject property shown here on the south side of O'Kelly Chapel Road, highlighted in yellow. It's a zoomed in aerial view of the subject property. It's located to the north of Hortons Creek Road and to the east of Yates Store Road. There is a stream buffer on the subject property according to our GIS maps and once again field determination of that exact location would be required at the time of development plan review. O'Kelly Chapel Road and Yates Store Road are thoroughfares on Cary's uh, Comprehensive Transportation Plan and Hortons Creek. Um, and let's see, I can't remember the name of this road right here, but this is also a uh, collector, proposed collector road. Uh, Cary's Parks, Recreation and Cultural Resources Facilities Master Plan identifies the location of existing and proposed greenway trails and streetside trails in the vicinity of the subject property. There is a uh, streetside trail proposed along Yates Store Road. And the closest transit um, is a future proposed route along Green Level Church Road. Land use plan designation is mixed and the existing zoning is planned development district. As I stated, there is an existing PDD. This is a portion of the PDD that's the uh, subject property, which is circled here in yellow. And it is currently labeled the town center tract in Amberley. And the allowed uses in that tract currently would be to allow up to 240,000 square feet of commercial use. 125,000 square feet of office use, and 800 dwelling units. Large portion of the property has already been developed um, with residential to the south, and then the wellness center here. So the subject property is, as I said, just a portion of that town center tract highlighted here in yellow. 
What's proposed is an amendment to, um, instead of a town center designation, designate this property with a new title, uh, O and I one or office and institutional one for 18 acres. And on that O and I tract, allow a school and associated school uses for up to 110,000 square feet. And then on the VC or village center tract, which is approximately 5.15 acres, uh, that would allow up to 50,000 square feet of office and institutional or commercial use. So just in summary, with the proposed PDD amendment, the 18.12 acre tract um, by conditions proposed by the applicant, 110,000 square feet for school use, maximum height of three stories. The VC three tract, 5.15 acres, 50,000 square feet, maximum proposed, maximum height of five stories, and the use is commercial and or office and institutional. So this is an overview of what's uh, approved to date in the town center tract and what change would occur if this rezoning, if this PDD amendment were approved, because right now there is no institutional use. This would be adding that 110,000 square feet. Uh, no new residential is proposed by this PDD amendment. There was a traffic study that was conducted, traffic study 15 TAR 392, uh, which analyzed the proposed uses of the elementary school and the 50,000 uh, square feet of retail. There were numerous amendments or numerous uh, mitigations that were suggested by that traffic study. They were not available at the time of the town council meeting, so we had a number of lengthy slides that, that summarized those, but those are now included in your, um, those are included in your, in your uh, staff report. And this is an image just to show you of the different intersections that were evaluated as part of that traffic study. And this is a map to show you the uh, properties within 800 feet of the subject pro property that were notified of the proposed rezoning. There were two protest petitions submitted, but they were outside that 100 foot boundary and therefore there was no valid protest. Um, concerns voiced by the uh, citizens who submitted the protest petitions pertain to traffic and a loss of potential commercial services. And then there would, were also a number of people who came and spoke at the public hearing, uh, concerns about traffic, specific questions about the school, um, how the school would be designed, a number of things that um, could not be answered at this time, but the school representatives took note of those concerns. Since the town council public hearing, um, staff has had numerous discussions with the applicant. There is a new zoning condition that was introduced uh, that addressed one of the traffic mitigations, and that was to uh, provide a second eastbound left turn lane for 450 feet at the intersection of NC 55 and O'Kelly Chapel Road, provide an extension of an existing eastbound turn lane to 450 feet, provide an extension of an eastbound right turn lane to 600 feet. And then later today, um, staff did get some additional language from the applicant that also offered a condition pertaining to the intersection of Green Level Church Road and O'Kelly Chapel Road to provide an eastbound turn lane for a distance of approximately 500 feet. The applicant's gonna speak following staff's presentation and um, go over a little bit more about what conditions are still being discussed and considered. There is discussion about a um, signalized intersection. We're still working on that language and the applicant's also gonna present to you a full explanation of why that lengthy list of traffic mitigations, some of them are not being proposed. So rather than go through all of those items on that list, I'm just gonna skip ahead um, just to the public hearing portion. And then once again, following the applicant's presentation and comments and the public hearing will be available as is our engineering staff for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. 
At this point in time, we'll hear from the applicant, please. Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Betty Parker. I'm Senior Director of Real Estate Services for the Wake County Public School System. Uh, I'm here today with Glenda S. Topp, but she's gone first all night, so I thought I'd go first tonight. Um, we also have Jeff Hoganato with SEPI Engineering. He's a traffic engineer that we work with to help us analyze some of these conditions. Um, I want to thank Ms. Granin. She did a great job, but she and Mr. Jensen have really been so helpful in helping us work through these conditions. This traffic report was voluminous, uh, and I'm sure there's way more that we could talk about in the few minutes I have up here. So uh, I just appreciate their flexibility in, in working with us and, and meeting as often as we have. I wanted to quickly touch on and sort of underscore why we're here. Um, your development demand in Cary has created, created a supply problem for us. Uh, we have three schools in the area that are horribly crowded. Um, Alston Ridge has 111% crowding, Mills Park at 112%, and Highcroft Elementary at 95%, and that's with nine modular classrooms. So this will be the fourth school that we're trying to build in this capital improvement in, uh, in Cary, in the western portion of Cary. So we're very excited about this one. Uh, we're happy to get through this process and hopefully get to work as soon as we can. Uh, this particular site is under contract. We're trying to meet those obligations so that we can close on time and continue on with design. This school is slated for a 2017 opening. So that's about as, as fast as we can get a school open for you. Um, we sought uh, a use change here, which is actually a down zoning. Uh, the amount of retail, the amount of commercial, office and institutional, potential residential would have a far greater impact on the traffic in this area than we would. So as, as large as this report is, I can't imagine what it would look like if it were fully developed as it's already entitled without the need for rezoning. So we recognize this is a busy area. It's a tight site for us. But as you can see from the, from the maps that you've been given, we're surrounded by residential, and, and that's the perfect place for a school. So that's, that's why we wanted to be here. Um, the, market, uh, the market's appetite for commercial development here has changed over time. When Amberley was first laid out, this was a great place for a market center. But other market areas, other commercial areas have developed close by, and the, the appetite for this site has moved. Most of the interest in this site has been by residential developers and some mixed use. So although some of the folks that spoke out at our earlier meetings really would like to see commercial, it's relocated not far away, and there just hasn't been that appetite. So we're trying to fill the biggest need we know of, which is to try to address this overcrowding in this western portion of Cary. Uh, I realize that traffic is going to be the biggest concern we have today. The needs analysis, as you can see from the map, is extensive. We worked with SEPI Engineering to give us a, a, a quick estimate, uh, and the estimate was that represents something like $5.8 million in improvements. There's not a single project that can carry that load. But fortunately, there are a lot of projects going on in the area. So we've collaborated with a couple of those to compare notes to see who can take on what portions, and we're trying to get as much done as we can. Of course, we have to be stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. So we tried to focus in on those areas where our impacts drove the need or substantially contributed to the need, and we tried to be mindful of our budget. Um, the UDO requires looking a mile radius around, but some of these we just don't contribute more than a few cars at a time. So we really focused on that. Rather than going through each one, we thought we'd leave that for your question section. We'll stay as long as you want, answer as many questions as you have, and I realize there's a lot, but I just wanted to give you the, the broad view that, uh, as I said to the town council, we're going to put our best foot forward to do what we think is reasonably flowing from our impacts to address those impacts and to be mindful of our budget at the same time. So that's, that's the approach that we've taken. Um, beyond that, uh, we're happy to be here for questions once you're done. I think Glenda has a few comments on compliance for you. Thank you for your time. And now I'm going to open the public hearing up to other comments. Anyone else?
Good evening. My name is Jacob Yakanovich. We're the neighbors to the north. I'm the president of the Stonewater Master Association. Uh, before I get into my prepared comments that are being shared with you this evening, I wanted to make one additional data point. Um, in an exhibit in the traffic analysis report, it designates VC3 as having approximately 50% of the southern part of VC3, as it's currently designated, as having some type of stormwater control. So it's really more likely to be about 2.575 acres of developable institutional commercial space on VC3. So just as a data point for you to consider. On to prepared comments. Uh, Stonewater is a planned development district comprised of 583 home sites in Wake and Chatham County. The 500 home sites in Wake are individually owned. The remaining 83 are developer owned located in Chatham County. Stonewater is a very diverse community. We have many home sites comprised of young families. As an example, 17 of the 19 homes on my street on Stonecroft Lane, about 89% are families with one or more children less than four years of age. This is just a sample data point common with streets throughout the entire Stonewater community. Overall, we feel the introduction of a school is a very good use of the land and will have a net positive effect on the surrounding area if appropriate steps are taken to improve the site and surrounding area accordingly. We'll gladly work with the Wake County Public School System and the Town Planning Department as the site plan undergoes continued review by the town. The Stonewater Master Association had an opportunity to review the proposal and traffic study, and we offer the following observations and comments regarding this proposal. The traffic study fails to factor school children pedestrian traffic as part of the traffic plan analysis. We ask that the traffic analysis report work with the Wake County Public School System to amend the report with data points that cover school children pedestrian traffic as part of the traffic plan analysis. We ask that the site plan detail exactly the safety crossing points across O'Kelly Chapel Road. With our current understanding, the Wake County Public School System would not provide a bus option for homes in the Stonewater community given the proximity to the school. The solution of walking to school from Stonewater makes perfect sense. However, this solution implies a non-trivial quantity of elementary school-aged children crossing four to five lanes of a major thoroughfare. We ask that the site plan clearly define the traffic calming procedures for the impacted sections of O'Kelly Chapel and de declare on either side of the school how far the school zone will extend and if it's going to extend in the Chatham County, is Chatham County also agreeing to the reduced speed prior to the school zone? This, this is a 45 to 50 mile per hour road as it's currently designated. Many of our homeowners continue to work, commute, excuse me, to work by traveling south and then turning eastbound or a left onto O'Kelly Chapel. The proposed school site sits on the western edge of Wake County, and so homes to the west are either in Chatham County or they're in a 50, 50 plus age restricted community. With an elementary school, we're likely to see traffic biased from the south, northbound on Yates Store, northbound on Stonecroft and Green Level Church, and from the west, from Feeder Streets onto O'Kelly Chapel. There is an existing stoplight intersection at Green Level Church and O'Kelly Chapel to assist with traffic management, though our opinion is that the area is going to require an additional stoplight intersection to manage traffic attempting to turn from O'Kelly Chapel into the school entrance and the traffic attempting to turn eastbound onto O'Kelly Chapel. We ask the site plan includes a school entrance with a stoplight intersection at Claystone and O'Kelly Chapel, uh, known on the third page of your uh, diagram as school access number one, as this will help as an avenue for the morning commute. The traffic study proposes that intersection as a directional crossover due to school access one designated as an egress point. However, according to the preliminary site plans that were included in the traffic study, school access one appears to be a primary ingress point for school staff and school visitors. Claystone Lane is our primary entrance to the Stonewater community. That road provides immediate access to four of our six subdivisions, as well as showcasing the primary features of our community, the clubhouse, the fountain, the monuments for the main subdivisions. So we believe this intersection as well will serve as a natural collection point, kids or kids, to <clears throat> attempt to cross as, as child pedestrian traffic O'Kelly Chapel Road, given the proximity of the intersection to the preliminary site plan building layout. It's because of these combined perspectives that we ask the intersection of Kelly Chapel and Claystone School Access 1 be revised as a traffic signal intersection with signalized pedestrian crossing approaches. Existing traffic conditions are observed at level of services E and F for those intersections that were included in the traffic study. Given the estimated by the traffic analysis study, the number of trips that are generated by the proposed elementary school will feel it will be necessary to include some quantity of traffic improvements as a zoning condition. Further, we feel that traffic improvements that deal with school children pedestrian traffic as the highest priority is a pragmatic and viable approach. Thank you for the opportunity to hear our position. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address us?
Glenda Top, Glenda S. Top and Associates. Just want to make a couple of points about the land use. Um, just adding on to what Ms. Parker said, we do believe that the proposed use um, of the school and the reduction of the commercial, given the pattern of development, particularly north of this site, um, is a justification for the change in the land use um, within the Amberley PDD. Also want to point out that, as Ms. Parker said, um, staff has been very helpful in working with us in coming up with the conditions that we have offered thus far for the um, off-site transportation items. Um, we are st still in ongoing discussions. We are working on the language. But given the schedule and the time frame that the Wake County School System is working under, um, it is important that um, the board take a vote tonight, although you are seeing the information, a lot of it for the first time tonight, um, in order to get this school open and moving forward, um, we do ask for the board to um, vote tonight and we hope to get your support. Thank you. This was for Thank you. Would anyone else like to address us? Anyone? This is for me. Seeing no one approach, I'm going to close the public hearing and open this case up for questions. I have a question. Um, my question is actually pertaining to the uh, traffic study. Um, so specifically the, um, the elementary school uh, portion of the traffic study. Um, what I'm showing or what I'm reading in the uh, staff's report is that there's an estimated 94 p.m. peak hour trips. Uh, of those, zero would be entering. Um, what I'm wondering due to, in this case, an elementary school, obviously there's going to be more than zero parents there picking up their kids. Um, I'm just wondering if that is tracked within the traffic study and if so, where that would be captured. Um, Typically in the traffic studies that, that are performed uh, through the town, we look at the AMP car and PMP car of the adjacent streets, uh, which is uh, the worst case scenario during, during the day. And uh, you, you only see 94 P car trips because uh, those, those only represent uh, staff leaving the school site. And uh, uh, parents picking up students, uh, those would be earlier uh, than the a network's PMP card, so that's why they are not reflected on in the study. Would the, as, as a follow-up, would those be included then in the um, the 690 AM peak hour trips for parents dropping doing the opposite, dropping their kids off? Yes, because school? because a lot of times um, the, the time when parents drop off the kids, they it, the time coincides with the AM peak hour of the adjacent street traffic, so it's all included in the AM peak hour. Okay. Yeah. What I'm sorry. What time is the PM? traffic study done? Um, it's uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, and we don't know what school hours are going to be here yet, though. Uh, no, we, we don't. So but we, we really can't say what the afternoon peak hours are going to be for the school? Yes. Okay. Because that I agree with you. We kind of forget that schools, I wish there were areas, different hours of peak studies around schools. <laughs> it's, it's a hard thing. Yeah. Is it possible, um, I know the um, one of the Speakers mentioned factoring school children, the pedestrian traffic. Is that ever factored in to a traffic study? Um, it wasn't factored in in this particular traffic study as, as it was focused on uh, vehicular traffic and uh, uh, trying to understand how the intersections would perform around them. But um, it is something that we can look at the site plan stage to make sure pedestrian crossings are provided. Um, but uh, I, I, the study has not analyzed uh, pedestrian crossing specifically. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Still on traffic, but this is a more broad question. So my understanding is that there are potentially more rezoning conditions that will be added to this, that there are still discussions that we don't know what the end result is going to be. Is that true? The applicant has a handout. Did you provide that? Yes, ma'am. Right, I can't read okay. that right. I, I, That's I, right. I passed it up. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, the question is, is this it? We're still working on the language, the enforceability, the legality of the language, making sure it's consistent with standard practices that the town has as it pertains to a potential traffic signal. So yes, it's going to be. It is 
we anticipate that we're gonna be getting some additional language and we still need to get an affidavit from the property owner or the contract purchaser, but there's the opportunity to introduce language right up to 10 days before the town council meeting with new zoning conditions. Okay, that's where I was going with this because well, it's I very difficult to vote on a rezoning when we don't have the actual rezoning in front of us. And if it's just language describing something that you've already told us, that's, that's something I might be able to get around. But if you're thinking additional um, improvements are gonna be made that we don't know about, I don't see how- I'm going to ask the applicant vote. to speak to what they presented to us this afternoon and then then our staff can weigh in a little bit if you've got questions okay because okay. I'm, I'm just going along the tabling thinking mm -hmm. here because we don't know what the rezoning is yes ma'am that's certainly understandable um, i don't anticipate additional zoning conditions I, I think the last condition that staff is having uh, that we are having discussions with on staff is the precision of the language describing our offer to signalize an intersection. Uh, I th in, in what we propose, we propose signalization within a certain period of time. Um, Mr. Jensen generously recommends that we take longer to do it, which I appreciate. Um, but I, I think there are some aspects of uh, representing a surety for the completion of the work that we just want to iron out exactly how that works with a governmental entity like the school system. Uh, versus developers to see if there's any flexibility there. So I don't anticipate any additional conditions in terms of any additional improvements. I think we're just tweaking our pledge of commitment to that signal to language that we agree upon as to its precision. Is that fair, Jerry? Yeah. So I think we've agreed to all the conditions. We just want it noted properly in an affidavit form. So I think it's fair to say that the substantive conditions are met and they're just ministerial uh, precision that has to be wrapped up. And which which intersection is it that's going to be signalized? We propose the signal at the intersection of Stonecroft. Uh, it's at the intersection between the Rex Wellness Center and the commercial tract. Mm -hmm. It's not the one the previous speaker requested. Um, the reason for that is we examine the impacts of our school traffic on uh, on that one and the other one that was recommended at Yates Store Road. Um, we have a far greater impact there. We have almost a nominal impact at the other. And from a budget perspective, again, we want to put our best foot forward. But keep in mind, although that this needs analysis identified a lot of potential for signalization, it's up to the DOT to approve when a signal makes warrants. And there was not an anticipation given the report that projected those counts out to 2019. It doesn't appear that the intersection the previous speaker would prefer in front of our school would make warrants to where DOT would approve it. We had an opportunity to meet together with DOT and town staff and identified where the, the greatest areas of concern were. So the one at Stonecroft is the one that we've proposed. And there's going to be uh, improvements along these roads just as a natural part of the rezoning that are not don't need to be conditions. So. Correct, that's part of the development requirement. We're required to build to a full section, which would be two lanes meeting divided. Okay, with thank you. Sidewalks. And just to be clear, Carla, if there were significant additional changes, that would trigger a public hearing at the town council meeting. And our experience has been sometimes when it would not. Well, okay, correct me here. I assumed it would. No, the applicants, frequently they try to get conditions in place prior to the final town council meeting because the council likes to make sure that they've seen what you've seen. But applicants do have the opportunity to introduce new conditions 10 days prior to the town council meeting and it doesn't trigger a third public hearing. It okay. does not. That but, was part of my but question. But the council yeah. has in the past when they've seen significantly different cases than what we've reviewed, mm -hmm. they've sent it back to us. Okay. Well, it sounds like we have the substance of what's gonna happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't clear on that. Okay. Other questions? Oh, I got a ton of them. Okay. I, I, this might be a silly question, but why is the parcel being divided? Why, is not, uh, why isn't the whole parcel gonna be the school? Uh, land is valuable and we tried to buy what's necessary for the school site. The additional acreage simply wasn't needed for the school site. So that's being sold for commercial use. This property is currently owned by Fifth Third Bank. 
uh, that okay. additional parcel, although five acres, right, the bank would like to make money. Uh, the parcel that's uh, 5.15 acres has a couple of challenges to it. It has a small stream buffer that comes into it, but it also has a large stormwater retention pond that actually serves Rex Wellness Center's property. So it's already encumbered significantly. So although that's a, a five acre tract, there's really only a couple, two and a half or so acres that will likely be developed. But yet that commands a sufficient price that they feel it's in their best interest to sell and, and we would like to preserve the taxpayer money for another site. And we thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Okay. Other questions? Um, yes, please. The uh, speed limit along the roads there are what? Uh, 45 miles per hour. And how are we going to address that? Because can we bring it down to, I know in other streets we can only bring it down to 35 and it takes an act of. Mr. Mr. Jensen's going to speak to that. We'll address, our, our, our standard specifications require uh, uh, speed flashers uh, along that roadway, which would uh, generally uh, reduce during school times a speed limit that's 10 miles less than what the current speed limit is out there right now. So we'll have a reduction during those drop-off period times. And that those, those flashers are required to be installed by the, by the schools themselves. Oh, okay. okay. Other questions? Seeing none, can we get a motion, please? Um, I'll motion, sure. <laughs> um, I move that the board forward case number 14-REZ-35 to the town council with a recommendation for approval as it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all the other applicable plans and is reasonable and in the public interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and presentation. We have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion. I, I thoroughly oh. support this, thank you. Um, <laughs> we really need it. I almost want a bigger school and take that other five acres. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I do understand though the parents' concerns about the little people um, and the traffic studies and I just urge that that, and I'm sure you will, really pay attention to that. Yeah, I second that feedback. Uh, I live in the area, and uh, one of the biggest concerns that I hear is you have uh, parents with two or three school-age children, and they have to split their child up to do two different elementary schools because of the uh, mm -hmm. the overcrowdedness in the area. So it's good to see that um, another school, is, elementary school, is coming to the area. However, um, I do have a lot of reservations about <clears throat> not enough traffic signals and not enough uh, road expansion in the area. Um, right there on 55 and uh, O'Kelly Chapel, there's a, a new town center that's, that's built and that already has a lot of traffic concerns as is. So I'm not sure that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the traffic mitigation strategies that you guys have presented tonight um, fully address my concerns on that. I think it's important that that we um, just make it clear that the um, the conditions that the gentleman was speaking about are basically site plan issues. So they're um, we're not ignoring those. Um, that we have to leave it in the hands of staff and the school board to do the right things there. Other comments? And I, I just second the motion because um, I do think that there's a school needed. I don't have children of my own, but here. That, and I know that area is growing tremendously, but um, I think that the gentlemen that addressed the issues with the, the children walking to school and everything are going to be addressed. I, th I feel that Ms. Parker and, and the Wake County School System are going to address those as they can be, and I just think it's a great project. Can I add one more thing, and I know this isn't um, parking. If we can't park in a parking lot, parents like us find spaces to park, which add to the traffic problems. <laughs> so, again, if I'm not giving my two cents in, but to a future planning, if we can also, it looks like there's kind of limited, and people get creative and park on roads then, so we can't do that, so. Other comments? Just one observation I'd like to make. I, I saw the uh, original public hearing where, where you'd mentioned how difficult it was to even find locations. You were only able to find three, this being the best one in that area. When you go back to the bond issue documents that are on the website, the need for schools is, is incredible. We have talked about it as much as we're empowered to talk about it. 
It may come up later, one never knows, but it, it's, uh, it's been an issue with a lot of these areas, school traffic, schools and traffic, and the one thing that I don't want lost in this discussion is how quickly you're trying to get that school yes. online. Uh, we've had zoning conditions in previous cases where they said we won't put a shovel in the ground until uh, a delay to give infrastructure a chance to catch up, and I'm really glad to hear how fast you're trying to make this happen, and, and I'm not going to do anything to slow that process down whatsoever. So I'm, I'm glad to, to see it. Uh, so much work being done so quickly to try to fix a problem that really needs to be fixed. I'll throw my two cents worth in here. Uh, just to echo the fact that it seems like a good faith effort on the part of the Wake County school system to address the things that they feel that they're directly responsible for. Um, I'd like to keep in mind the fact that we're reducing the overall traffic count potential here from about 4,000 uh, trips to around 1,000. So given the fact that uh, we're downsizing the zoning, uh, I, I just really feel that the necessity to get a, another public school out in this part of Cary and the way the town and the uh, school system are going about it um, we're nitpicking when we start talking about where certain traffic lights are going to go. Ultimately, this development may move forward. Uh, we recognize that it's had its problems in development. Uh, this is one way to kind of make up for some things that the marketplace is, is doing out there. And uh, I, I would just hate to see us uh, not move this along due to the fact that we're getting a little perturbed about signalment. Uh, I, I do think that you, the one thing you have to realize, traffic safety, traffic reports don't necessarily reflect safety. So uh, I think the school system is going to bear the stewardship issue of that. Uh, one thing I want to add is I definitely reflect with uh, the other board members uh, have stated and, and definitely in support of this. Uh, one thing I did want to do is uh, commend the applicant on the ability to work with other developments and other developers to help mitigate some of these costs. And I know one of my uh, things that, at least my sh short tenure here on the board, I, have, we've, I don't feel like we have seen is a lot of that collaboration. And I really just wanted to commend on the applicant on the ability to get with um, other developments and, and to kind of go in together to help share some of those costs. Um, as stated, these mitigation costs are somewhat, uh, or can get pretty expensive. Um, and, and joining in with other developers, I think is really helping to, uh, to drive some of these. And, and I commend uh, the applicant on that. Well, I'd like to pipe in. I, I spent this afternoon in a uh, Wake County um, Board of Commissioners work session and one of the primary topics was the public schools budget. And a lot of that was talking about what we need that we can't have. Well, here's something we desperately need that we can. And it's really encouraging to see this need be funded, be ready to go, and to see you aggressively pushing us to move this forward because we have a critical need, particularly in Western Wake County. And uh, tell you what, if you want to build some more schools here, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. <laughs> Other questions? Other comments? In that case, I'm going to call us to a vote. All those in favor of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. That's how we feel about your schools. <laughs> and we're going to move on to round 30A of the LDO amendments. Ms. Beerman? Thank you. Uh, this tonight is the public hearing for item A of the round 30 amendments to the LDO. Later in your agenda, the remainder of the LDO items will be presented just as a discussion item. Um, item, uh, well, this is the, the tentative schedule. All of the round 30 amendments were presented to the town council at a public hearing on January 28th. They were presented to you, uh, there's a lot of discussion at your work session on February 9th. Uh, this evening you may make a recommendation and then that would be forwarded on to the town council for a possible decision on April 21st. Item A is the Walnut Street Corridor. 
Um, this amendment would revise development standards for the infill subdistrict of the Walnut Street Corridor Transitional Zoning District. Um, this item is based on council direction. We were uh, directed to evaluate the district standards to provide more flexibility for redevelopment within particularly this infill subdistrict. And this was at the, um, was initiated by the property owner with the standards developed with input from the property owner. The colored areas here show the entirety of the Walnut Street uh, corridor plan area and three sub-districts that uh, have different development standards within that area. Um, this this uh, portion of Long Walnut Street is subject to uh, more specific standards than other areas to uh, accommodate for the increased traffic that we see on such a major um, corridor as these areas transition from single family homes to allow some other uses that are compatible uh, with the adjacent areas. The subject of this change uh, is the infill subdistrict. There are two parcels included in the infill subdistrict, uh, one on the south side of Walnut Street, which is a town park uh, and would not, uh, from a practical standpoint, be affected by this amendment. The other is the other large parcel. This is about 11 acres. Currently, there is a mobile home park developed on that site that has been there for a number of years. This shows the uh, changes that are proposed. Currently, within 300 feet of Walnut Street on this site, which is approximately uh, a third, the front third of the site, the allowable <clears throat> land uses include detached dwellings, various office and institutional uses with some limited commercial um, and multifamily use if the principal use is office or personal service. So there's um, some variety of uses allowed, but, but largely uh, office and institutional other than the um, single family. When you get uh, deeper into the property, more than 300 feet from Walnut Street, the allowable uses there are detached dwellings with a maximum of five units per acre allowed, town facilities such as a public park and religious assembly use. This proposed change would add townhomes as a permitted use within the entirety of the district with the maximum density of five units per acre. Uh, would point out that the uh, this would be an use in addition to what's already allowed. So the other uses that are, that are allowed in the front part or closer to Walnut Street would continue to be allowed. With regard to the perimeter buffer, currently within 300 feet of Walnut Street where some of the more uh, intense um, institutional uses are allowed, the width of the perimeter buffer is 40 feet, a type, uh, type A 40 um, foot buffer. And as you go, further than 300 feet from Walnut Street, the minimum buffer width is reduced to 25 feet. The proposed um, amendment would apply a 25 foot type A buffer along the entirety um, of the perimeter for the townhome use and detached dwellings if that was the, the use that was developed on the site. I uh, would note this is an increase from the public hearing um, uh, where the, the initial buffer width was proposed at 20 feet, so they did increase uh, that by an additional five feet. And again, I would point out that if the um, other non-residential uses uh, were um, developed on the site, then the existing 40-foot buffer would continue to apply on the, the first 300 feet. Other changes, there's currently a buffer wall that's required along the entirety of the property. That wall would no longer be required for detached dwellings and townhomes. Again, the, that uh, requirement for the wall would remain for the other uses. The minimum lot width is currently 50 feet for all uses. That would be reduced to 34 feet for townhomes and 40 feet for detached dwellings. There are also some changes to the building setbacks. Uh, currently, a 25-foot setback is required for all side and rear property lines. And 
um, there is a um, is requested to change that to um, to provide smaller setbacks for townhomes and detached dwellings to uh, enable the development there. Would also point out that the there is also a 10-foot setback required from perimeter buffers in all cases. So um, that was another change that we made in the ordinance, just to make that clarification, because there was there was some concern regarding how close uh, the dwellings could be to the perimeter of the property line. I do want to point out that there is a, a setback from the perimeter buffer that's not expressed in the actual building setback numbers. Another change that was requested relates to building separation. Currently, there's a 16-foot um, separation required between townhome buildings, generally in the ordinance. Um, this, this proposed change would reduce that, um, that setback or the separation between townhomes to six feet if the two um, townhome buildings that were being separated each contained only two units. Otherwise, the separation of 16 feet would remain. This is just an illustration that uh, showing the perimeter buffer and the setbacks and just um, a closer in view where you can see the 25 uh, foot perimeter buffer, the 10 foot building setback from the buffer and then an 18 foot setback from uh, internal streets, uh, just as an example. And again, these are the setbacks that would apply for townhome or detached dwellings. At the public hearing, there were several speakers from the adjoining neighborhood that expressed some concern with the proposal, uh, largely related to setbacks and buffers, uh, some concerns related to tree removal with the redevelopment of the adjacent or with the redevelopment of the subject property, and then general concerns related to the intensity of the use as it's adjacent to um, larger lot single family homes. And that concludes staff's comments. Um, I'll be available for questions um, following the public hearing. Thank you. At this point, we'll open the public hearing. And since we don't have an applicant, the applicant we've already heard from, um, we'll open this up for comments from anyone else that would like to address us. My glass is on so I can see what I'm doing. Good evening, uh, board members and Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Michael Wirt. I live at 1225 Sturdivant Drive. Um, my property backs onto the uh, infill uh, parcel that we're talking about. So here are my comments. There are no compelling reasons for adopting the proposed amendments to the LDO associated with this infill parcel. The proposed amendments provide virtually no public community benefit and it appears that only the owner and developer of the infill parcel would benefit from these proposed changes. The current standards for the CT infill subdistrict allow for reasonable development of the parcel that would be more compatible with the character of the surrounding R12 zone neighborhoods and would also be more in keeping with the spirit and uh, of the vision and intent of the Cary Comprehensive Plan. It is my understanding that because the owner is asking only for ordinance standard changes within the, uh, the specific district, he does not have to submit a formal rezoning application. However, because of the signif significant number and type of changes that the owner is requesting, he is essentially asking for this parcel to be rezoned to accommodate his development plans. Most of these changes that he's proposed um, actually are very compatible with a TR zone. So, uh, if, you know, everything on there is pretty close to that. Without, without actually going through the rezoning process, he does not have to provide the required justifications for his proposed changes. As members of the board know, these justifications include stating how the proposed rezoning would be beneficial or detrimental to the surrounding neighbors and the community, and also how all the allowable uses with the proposed rezoning are compatible with or relate to the uses currently present on adjacent tracks which is all R12. I believe that the owner would not be able to provide these acceptable justifications to meet the requirements for rezoning if he did apply. Yet if the proposed changes to the standards are accepted, the planning board and town council will have aided him in accomplishing his goal without all the legal formality of forms, fees, and justifications. 
Since the ordinance standards are law, it appears that the owner's request is designed to avoid the rezoning process and change the law to accommodate only one individual. The unfairness and questionable nature of this request is obvious. I have spoken with some of my neighbors and we request that the Planning and Zoning Board recommend to the Town Council to reject the proposed amendments as currently submitted. Removing old growth trees and inserting rows of townhomes in their places is at the heart of our objections to the proposed changes. By denying townhomes as a permitted use, most of the objections to this development in this parcel would go away. The buffers and setbacks would not have to be changed or adjusted, and the development compatible with current permitted land use would be more in keeping with the character of the mature neighborhoods that surround the infield parcel. All of this is R12 surrounding it completely. Most of the people living around along the perimeter of this have been in their homes for at least 15 to 30 years. We also feel that it's possible that a revised proposal for development that doesn't include townhomes and doesn't require significant changes to the current CT subdistrict standards could be acceptable to the neighbors as well as the owner. We suggest that any new proposed plan should show a desire for the owner to be a good neighbor by creating a development plan that is consistent with a vision and intent of the Curie Comprehensive Plan and is also compatible with the character and style of our surrounding neighborhoods. I would recommend that he go with R12 or at least stay with what he has going on right now. Um, all of the homes around it, everything across the street, this is like sticking something brand new right in the middle of R12. There's nothing else around there but R12 homes. So I would suggest that he be denied this ability to change the law just to suit him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Board. My name is Michael Weeks. I'm one of four owners of the property in question. My brother and two sisters and I inherited this property in 1987. And that the changes we're requesting as this Carter is going through an evolutionary process, I started thinking about the history that my great grandfather on my mother's side bought this land as timberland in the Depression era. And in 1950, when he died, my grandmother was upset that she inherited that red clay land at Cary, and her brother got the good farmland in Southern Lake County. So that uh, my father, built a mobile home park there in the late 50s, and that at the time, it was woods all around it. There weren't any houses, and there was uh, student housing primarily for married students in C State. Governor Jim Hunt and his wife lived there. When Lou Holtz was hired to come to NC State, he rented a trailer there until his family moved here and they found a home. And then in the late 60s, early 70s, my grandmother sold the residual land to what is now Walnut Hills. The um, proposed changes that were in the current ordinance we supported when it came through 10, 12, 15 years ago. But under that ordinance, without a rezoning, we're entitled, according to that ordinance, to have 125,000 square feet of mixed use retail office apartments and five units an acre on a residual in the rear. What we're asking is to be able to have five units an acre on the entire site. That I have a younger sister, we're all getting near retirement age, but the younger sister just moved into a community that was done by a high-end developer that's townhouse type duplexes and it's empty nesters and that uh, it's a wonderful product. You know, it's low maintenance, small yards, but big buffers surrounding to the adjacent neighbors. And that's what we want to do here. We were okay with the, the plans as they were before and are still okay with that if somebody comes along and wants to do mixed use, but that Carter's not becoming a mixed use Carter. With the two major shopping centers, there's some small office and institutional, but the current use doesn't allow what we would like to see there. When we met with staff to talk about the changes that would need to take place, the ordinance talks about 50 foot lot width, but it doesn't define the depth. So that they could be 50 by 30 as far as the depth. And that there's a lot of language in the ordinance 
that was needing to be improved. We're not requesting the change to circumvent the law. We're just trying to say the ordinance needs to be rewritten and what we want to do will be compatible with that adjacent neighborhood and that there are probably with the empty nesters there will be uh, a lot more high end than anything that's there now for sure because the trailer parks is beyond its useful life. There were some questions at the work session about the people in the park. We don't own any trailers and the people that are there are being relocated. We're moving six to another park. Four have already left. And a, one other park owner came and offered with flyers that they would pay up to $3,500 per mobile home to relocate them. We gave notice in January that we would close by August 31st or August 30th. And that's to give them nine months time so they could relocate. And we're providing assistance to them if they relocate to our park, if we have its another part of Wake County or other places they're getting assistance also. So um, if you have any questions of our needs or desires for what we're requesting with this property, be glad to answer them. And uh, Jay Galise is working as a consultant with us and with the development portion of the site once that happens. Thank, Thank you. you. Would anyone else like to address us? <clears throat> My name is Michelle Huber. I live at 1229 Sturdivant Drive. I live at the top end of Sturdivant Drive, where currently there is a 40-foot buffer, which is being requested to be changed to 25. As Mr. Weeks mentioned in his previous comment, he is requesting a rezoning of the property, but he is not following the proper rules and laws for rezoning. That causes many problems for the current residents, as he does not have to go through any of the development processes, any of the rules of getting the studies followed. Every time that it rains, a large amount of water comes off of that property into my backyard and many of my neighbor's backyards. We have a small pond in our backyard every time it rains and a stream down beside the house. What is going to happen when all of that property is redeveloped? Where's all that water going to go? Am I just going to plant bog plants? Although I have nothing against bogs, I can't imagine that I want them in my backyard. I prefer the the grass and the flowers and the trees that I currently have. But those don't have to be followed without him having to put forth a proper zoning request, a proper, the proper permits and forms and formalities that have to be followed. Nobody's looking at any of the water use. It was mentioned in many of the previous applications, but nobody's looking at any of that. They're just answer, asking for a blanket change of the use of this land without looking at any of the impact. If this was in your backyard, none of you would allow that. You would not allow a change of use of property in your backyard without the proper rules and procedures being followed. But that's what's being asked for in this case. That is not fair to any of the existing neighborhood. It is a neighborhood around there. Down the street, there are some townhomes. They're wonderful places. We have many friends and associates that live there. But even they have a uh, fencing between the townhomes and the residential areas. They're requiring no fencing, no wall, and they're requiring a reduction of the buffer. In my case, it would be nearly half where I am living. And in addition to the rezoning and the reduce, reduction of all of the trees and all of the natural area, where's all that water going to go? Right onto my property. Right onto my neighbor's properties. That's not okay. If they want a rezoning of this property so that they can develop it, they need to put forth a request for a rezoning. They need to put forth the proper forms. They need to take all of the time to follow the rules to make sure that this isn't going to impact negatively the surrounding area. It's not just a matter of we think a townhome area would be cool, we're going to put it here and this is why we like it. That's not enough. They said that they supported this when it was put in place 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. Then why the change now? If they supported it then and they want a change now, then they need to follow the proper procedures so that this change isn't detrimental. I and my neighbors would request that you deny this 
if they would like a change, we need the proper procedures followed so it's not detrimental to us, to our lives, to our homes, and our property values. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address us? Good evening. My name is Ralph Pisicani. Would, would you mind using the, okay, there you go. I see it. the um, audio guys are real picky about which microphone we're talking to. And Hi, my name is Ralph Pisicani. I've been living in Cary for over would 35 years. Can you do that one more time for me? I'm not. I'm Hi, my name is Ralph Dogfish. No, I'm kidding. That's the English translation of the Italian name, Pisacani. P I S A C A N E. And my Irish wife, if she was here tonight, who was born in Dublin, Ireland, would have been very happy with that. Happy Thanksgiving, Patrick's Day. So uh, I'm here and I've lived in Kerry for over 35 years uh, in a couple of different locations. Uh, my son and I, my sons and I have owned the property on 1224 Walnut Street, which is a cross on the other side of the road, right there at the traffic light at Sturdivant. And the trailer park in question here, the property, is just down the road from us. We can almost see it from our, from our front yard. I hold up something here, which probably doesn't mean a lot to anybody here, but it's called the Lundy Group. 13 years ago, the Lundy Group put together a proposal to the council, and that's what actually initiated the changes that took place at the time. Unfortunately for all of us, about 11 property owners, the Lundy Group did not purchase the property in the end because of all the restrictions that were put on it that made it impossible for them to turn it into any kind of a development that they could see putting in this kind of money that it was going to take to do it and pay all the property owners. I actually have an old layout in here of what they proposed. It was a really neat project. It would have taken care of everything from Nobles all the way down to, what is it called, Greenwood, Circle, developing all of those properties, approximately 11 acres. Again, this is how this whole corridor was then set at that time, and but the restrictions to satisfy the neighbors behind because they come out of the woodworks saying, no, we can't have this. Meanwhile, they like us being the property owners in front of them, buffering the noise from Wanna Street. When I bought this property, it was a two-lane highway. Since then, it is a four-lane highway with a turning lane with 45 miles an hour. If I could tell you over the last 25 years how many cars have ended up in my front yard, I lost count because of the coming around that bend, and they're not doing 45, folks. They're doing 50 and 55. We don't have a lot of traffic control there, but the bottom line is I come to you tonight to speak in favor of what the property owners are trying to do in, with the trailer park. You know, trailer parks have never been the most invitable type of situation in most communities, so I don't understand the people behind. They should be wanting to be happy that possibly we're going to remove a trailer park and put in a, a better facility. On my side of the road, it's the same thing. Of all the properties, there is probably approximately 26, if I remember correctly, of properties that were put into this corridor thing. The actual uh, residential properties that border most of them is only about 36. The majority of them are actually the better part of them are around that trailer park because of the way the land went inside, okay? The, the change is not, nobody's asking for a rezoning here, as you know, it's already been done. That was done 13 years ago. And guess how many properties have been sold in 13 years? Anybody have any idea here? Three? Well, I think the, the town bought the uh, park, right? Well, yeah, well, I was gonna say that. Do we have buffer walls around the park? Eight foot high masonry buffer walls? By the way, I just broke a rule on that. Well, no, but did the, did the town put eight foot high buffer walls buffering all the residential properties? No. Is there, you know, again, there may be some buffers, and I agree with these people. There should be some kind of a, a land buffer, but I'm in the same boat on the other side of the road. There was a woman here that owned the property behind, right behind uh, Nobles, the first property after you get behind Nobles there, where the, we expanded the, the holding pond. I think you all know where that is. She wouldn't sell that property to the city to, to expand that because she was so fed up with Carrie at that time. Her name was Mabel, Mabel Smithy. Mabel said in our meetings among the, uh, the 11 property owners that were trying to put this deal together with the Lundy Group, Mabel said, folks, I'm gonna tell you right now, I've been around here too long to know better. This is not going to happen and I will be dead before anything ever happens. That was 13 years ago. Mabel's not with us anymore. 
There are many other property owners that are dying. They can't sell their properties as residential properties, folks. It's impossible. Nobody's gonna buy a piece of land and put their family in it with a house with traffic flying by you at 50 and 55 miles an hour. There are things that need to be changed. Jack Smith said it himself in the meeting, the, current, the previous meeting with the council. What they thought they were doing 13 years ago, they thought might work. They were hoping it would work. They were trying to satisfy all of the people living behind. And I still would like to see that happen. But again, there's a point in time that says you gotta face reality. We can't sell them as residential properties. They may be zoned, currently they're not, but with all the restrictions, you can't get a developer to come in. We've had numerous developers who wanted to come in and do something. One of the most recent was a senior type of assistant living facility. They ended up going someplace else because when they got through with the city, they said, we can't afford to do this. We'd have to buy two more acres of land that we really don't need. But that's because of all those restrictions. So it's time for something to be done. And I think this would be the first place to start is let's help this guy get his properties taken care of. And those people are going to be living in what? They're not going to have business there. I'm sorry, so. your time has run out. All right, okay. That's to everybody I will else. end I it that stop. way again. I appreciate you giving this a lot of thought, at least a lot more than has been given in the past years. And hopefully we can do something right this time. Thank you. Anyone else like to address us? My name's Carol Owens. I live at 1220 Kimbolton Drive, which is directly behind the trailer park. Um, we are a long distance from Walnut Street and we'd like to keep it that way. <laughs> um, we don't have all the noise that some of the other um, residents do and we can sympathize with them. We can sympathize with the gentleman who just spoke who wants to sell his land. I would not want to live on Walnut Street myself. But um, that doesn't mean that I want his problems in my backyard either. I mean, I don't have them now, so I don't want them. Um, I looked, we took a measuring stick and measured from our back fence, the 25 foot buffer, the additional 10 foot perimeter. And I'm like, if they're just that far on the other side of our fence, they're gonna be looking right down in our yard when we have breakfast on our back porch, they're gonna be having breakfast with us. We have a single story ranch. They're talking about putting in town homes, which we don't know exactly how tall that'll be, but that indicates two, three, maybe even four stories. And a lot of times the deck is on the second story. They'll be looking right over our eight foot fence and into our backyard. Trailer Park may not be the best neighbor, but we actually know some of the people there. Enrique lives right on the other side of our fence. He's a good neighbor for us. He doesn't look in our yard. We don't look in his yard. So with the townhomes coming in, we will be losing that privacy. Understand with single family development, it could be ranch, they could be one story, they could be multi-story. But at least with a townhome, we know that it definitely will be multiple stories. And if they're facing our back fence, they'll be looking directly into our backyard. So we would like to let you know we do not want to lose our privacy. We like the tall trees that are there. We have concerns, as some of the other speakers have said, about taking down some of those trees with development. Also, the water flow. We have plenty of water coming into our backyard also. We are downstream as far as uh, property flow, so we get a lot of runoff from them. So we're also concerned about that. So anyway. Thank you for listening, and um, we hope you'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address us? Good evening. My name is Doug Lewis. Live at 1201 Deerfield Drive. Um, don't live adjacent to the area, but people uh, in Gray Owl Garth, which goes off of Kim Bolton, plus the uh, cul-de-sac on uh, Deerfield uh, are adjacent to this property. One of my biggest concern is that the appearance of the buffer change is for the benefit of one property only. 
I concur that changes perhaps need to be made, but I would like to see it for the whole Walnut Street corridor. It appears to be a form of favoritism that the buffers are materially decreased on one property and not on any of the others. If that's allowed to go forward, then I think any property would make the argument you've already set a precedent and that that precedent would be honored anywhere in the corridor. So rather than do this piecemeal, I would rather see a zoning approach where the whole corridor is reevaluated and we have rules that apply equally to everyone in the corridor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Melbourne Bailey. I live in uh, Ivy Meadow, Meadows, which is the adjacent uh, subdivision to Walnut Hill. One more time, your name was? Uh, Melbourne Bailey. I'd like to, um, I'd like to speak in opposition to the, to the changing of the buffer areas. Um, you've heard actually several speakers, some of the, which are in favor of, the, of this change, actually talk about the traffic that's on Walnut Street already. It seems like to me that reducing the buffers actually allows the in increase in density uh, of the development, which is going to increase the traffic problem. And if you looked at if you've looked at the map, which I'm sure you have, of where the infill area is, what you see is that's on the curve in Walnut Street. So I presume with this high density, what you're going to do is have to put another stoplight. R recognize that this this uh, infill area has an, only one outlet on Walnut Street. It has no outlet or on other parts of the property. There's one outlet on Walnut Street in the curve on Walnut Street, and you're talking about increasing the density of the development for, for, this, um, for this particular infill area, which just seems like to me um, is inadvisable. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone? seeing anybody coming down to the podium I'm going to close the public hearing and open this um, this case up for board questions um, if this were any other part of town if we weren't talking about the Walnut Street corridor what would be the buffer requirement between our 12 and townhomes I believe that would be 40 feet if it okay. was not within um, this area. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Anyone else? Well, I guess I'll ask something for me and for anyone else interested. What is the current zoning of this, this entire area? The Order transitional? It's the it's corridor transitional. Uh, there are three sub districts, right. and this is the infill sub district. So there's a zoning in place. So, for the question we've heard several times tonight, why is there not a rezoning? Would you please give me a minute on that? Um, that would be a way. This could be done, um, I suppose, as a rezoning, but there. In this case, there were, because there are very specific standards associated with the um, corridor transition area and the standards within the district, uh, in order for an additional use to be developed, the actual standards of the, um, the district itself because in, in this case, you've got a sub-district that calls out very specific uses and specific standards within that district. So before a rezoning could be done even, to, the, the district itself would have to be modified to allow those uses within right. the zoning district. Thank you. And the LDO I mean, amendment we're looking at right now applies to that entire sub-district. Right. 
it's not not applying to in in this case because this zoning district only includes two parcels it becomes more specific sure. towards this particular parcel where this would apply to however when you look at that sub district there is another parcel that's involved and it's part of um, a series of amendments that were that were um, adopted in implementing the um, small area plan related to the entire corridor. So it really needs to be addressed within the, um, within the district that, um, within that district that has those specific standards that's a part of the ordinance. Thank you. Now, Thanks. whether or not the LDO is amended, if someone were to develop a property inside the sub-district we're talking about today, when they go to site plan, are they subject to the same uh, review, the same standards by which any other property that goes to site plan anywhere else zoned some other way would be subject to? Yes, they are. So the stormwater storm all that other all stuff, of those requirements. That all has to be handled yes. at site plan. So this is this. This is uh, different in that we're just amending an LDO for a quarter that's specifically set out, carved out as a, for a specific use. But all other administrative procedures remain intact should something go further down the pipeline. Right. The, um, the process is a, little, is a little different. I mean, there's the rezoning process or the process to amend the ordinance amendment. Uh, both of those processes and require the public hearing, but in both cases, if the end result is the uses are changed, whenever those uses are developed, they're subject to all of the same standards in the ordinance in, in terms of uh, applying those standards that we use to protect adjacent properties and make sure that, that the uh, development is appropriate. Thank you very much. And if I can, if I can make one more um, comment just to expand on the question regarding um, the buffer, the, the buffer that would be required between um, the R12 area and an adjacent townhome would be a 40-foot Type A buffer. However, if that was if that was um, done in a new, uh, you know, in a different, a new neutral area outside of this area, there is the um, opportunity to apply. Uh, to split the buffer between adjacent properties. So theoretically, you could have half of the buffer as, as you know, a 20-foot area on one side of a developed property and uh, the remaining 20 feet on the opposite side, so you have uh, 40 feet combined. In this case, with the adjacent property already being developed, that half of the buffer was not done on the adjacent property. So if that were to be applied in this case, the entire 40 feet would be on this property, the subject property. However, there could be situations where that 40 feet would be split between properties, just as a clarification for how those buffers work. Thank you. That's all I have. Other questions? I have a question. Please. Um, and if you could go back to slide 86, please. Um, so my question is uh, pertaining to the buffer. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I guess, a little uneasy about that, the 25-foot uh, buffer. Um, and my question would be, if that were increased to 40 feet, um, creating a 50-foot setback from the property line, mm -hmm. would that still allow a townhome development to be built? Or would that create, because I realize that you have a very narrow space to work here with, you know, a site plan to plan to place how townhomes. But I guess my question is, would it still, if the buffer were increased to 40 feet, would it still be developable under I, the current? Um, I can't answer that. It would certainly reduce the size of any structures that would be able to be uh, developed there because you would be taking away um, 10 feet on each side, an additional area on each side of the property. And it's, um, you know, it's a relatively narrow uh, site as it is. Um, but that's something I would would have to defer to whoever would be potentially developing a property to, to make the determination as to whether or not uh, that would be adequate to build on with a reasonable size unit. Um, 
question? There was a slide where it talked about the wall. There was some wordage there. Could you go back to that one? Please, um, me have a second. The wall? Yes, please. Okay. It says under proposed changes, wall not required. Is that meaning the wall is going to stay there? That's there because we did have a comment made on that. Um, with with this change, it would specify that within the infill district, that the wall would not be required if the adjacent, if the proposed land use was detached dwellings or townhomes. Um, other uses where if a wall was already required would be main, maintained, but it would just be for the detached dwellings and townhomes that, that the wall would no longer require as the uses would be more similar to the adjacent residential uses. So the wall would be taken down maybe in this situation? Well, it's, there's not a wall. It's, there's not a wall there now, but in terms of new development, there wouldn't be a mason, an eight foot masonry wall would not be required. Um, there was a comment about the trees, the existing trees. So this would definitely fall into the new ordinance with the champion trees being saved, et cetera. Yes, it would. Great. Thank you. Do, do you have a slide that shows the configuration of the lots adjacent to the northern portion of this property? Um. You can see the um, this portion. And just for clarification, the, the the lots in yellow those are now commercial. Is that correct? Um, not all of them. They're in a different um, they're in a different sub district. Uh, those are. The conversion parcels, they have a different set of standards associated with them. Okay. But there are commercial uses also. There are some. Um, there, I think most of those, if not all of those, were un initially single family homes. homes. Some of them had been converted to more uh, office um, types of uses. There may be some, I believe there's some that are still uh, residential. <laughs> Other questions? A lot of steam. In that case, does someone have a motion? I do. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board forward LDO Amendment 30-A to town council with a recommendation for approval as it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all the other applicable plans and is reasonable and in the public interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and presentation. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'd like to second. We have a motion and a second <coughs> discussion. Um, well, I'm not going to support the motion. Um, I, I think townhomes are actually a good use here, but it bothers me that we are not holding, you know, the buffer standards to the same that we would anywhere else in town. I, I don't just because this is considered an infill area and um, I don't see any reason why these people should deserve any less than anyone else in town. I think a 40 foot buffer would be appropriate here. And you know, while the yield might not be as great, I believe that you know they can still do something with this property. But these people are already under a lot of duress. I don't want to add to that. Other comments? Yes, I um, I agree with Carlos um, with the buffer, and, and I'm also not going to uh, be able to support this for that reason. Um, I really don't think it's fair for the existing homeowners. Um, I mean, any other homeowner, um, or not any other, but for the most part, other homeowners in this similar situation would be receiving a 40-foot buffer. Um, I feel like they're shortchanging the existing homeowners here, and uh, really for that reason um, alone, I'm not going to be able to support this. Other questions? Mr. Chair. Other options? I concur with the previous two speakers uh, with regard to uh, not being able to support this particular uh, amendment. Uh, again, going back to, to the buffers, I recognize that the property owner uh, has a desire to modify the use of this and other property owners uh, along Wallace Street in the future may also have the, the same desire. 
but I feel that there's the opportunity to develop that space and still maintain the buffers and provide some protection to the existing uh, adjacent property owners uh, and allow them to maintain the, the quality of life and that they've been accustomed to for quite a number of years in, in that area. That So given that, I, I will not support this. Other comments? I guess I should mention why I, uh, I'm, I make a move to, to approve this and that, or make a motion to do so. And, and that is, this is a, a unique circumstance that the town doesn't take or, or didn't take in 2002, establishing a corridor plan lightly. I mean, there's a recognition that the rules that we try to generically apply to developments everywhere may not apply everywhere. And, and in the, uh, the staff report, it says, uh, you know, Wallet Street was widening. It got, it became a major thoroughfare long before that 2002 widening. And, and there may be forces that dictate that, well, I'm not going to have a, a lot of single family detached developments wanting to build right next to Walnut Street, very possibly. I, I don't know what the rationale for that was, but the town clearly put a lot of thought into this and tried to, tried to work it out for, for everyone there. This to me just seems to be a, a sort of a mid-course correction. We've tried it. In 2002, it succeeded in some places, in other places it hadn't, and so some changes are being made to one of the sub-districts. Uh, sub yeah, it sure it, it looks like it's it's a tailor-made action for one property owner. I'll give you that. That it sure looks that way. But this is about as as sort of above board. This could just as easily be affecting 30 different parcels. And and I would support it just the same because I think the the idea of this is a unique situation and we're trying to make the best and allow the most opportunities for a place that I'm sorry, this place isn't the other areas we've been looking at today that are in the middle of nowhere in old farmer fields that can, can build cul-de-sacs and, and whatever they want to do. It's, it's a little tougher. So, so I think the staff's done a really good job of, of updating something that, that needs updating. Other comments? I'm not comfortable with the 20-foot buffer either. I think that's not a lot of distance. And to start a thing where you're counting somebody else's buffer into yours in this area only. I appreciate that we have to do something creative here and it's a difficult area, but I'm not going to support this either. I've had a little bit of heartache on this ever since we saw, we saw it in our work session. And I think that some of the issues that came up from the speakers tonight have just, I, I'm with the buff, I don't like the buffer. There's just something that I, I'm not comfortable with, so I'm not going to be able to support it either. Do you want to say anything? Everybody else is piped in now. <laughs> He's still making up his mind. No pressure. I'm, 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 I'm weighing in. I'm trying to get as much uh, feedback and insight from other board members and also taking in the... Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, if I may, while well, Corey is trying to figure out what he wants to say here, <laughs> uh, I'd like to remind the board that typically we let the person that made the motion and the person that second the motion speak first. And we don't seem to be holding to that protocol. I apologize, that was my fault. Yeah, I know. Uh, since I seconded this, and since I'm a neighbor who lives probably a half a mile away from here, used to live on Sturdivant Street, I think I can speak with some sense of what's going on here. And it's going to be very contrary to what you're hearing from most of these board members. The first thing I want to state is that Kerry is trying to redevelop the downtown. And there are only so many gateways into Kerry and the downtown, one of which is Walnut, one of which is Harrison. You could probably consider Kerry Town Boulevard a gateway. Uh, you could probably consider Chapel Hill Road 54. And frankly, I'm disappointed at where we're going. Uh, we had a chance to do something with this corridor in terms of a median strip and vegetation that would have made this look a lot better than it looks right now. And for reasons that involve DOT and other things, it never got done. Kerry Town Boulevard had an opportunity to put a great 
neighborhood in with maybe 270 houses. And that got shot down primarily by the council, not necessarily so much by neighbors objecting. Matter of fact, most of the neighbors wanted to see it. Um, the other end of Carytown, moving into downtown, could have had a median strip and vegetation in the median strip. And all the NIMBYs came out and said, no, I don't want to have to make a right hand only turn. And so that got turned down. This neighborhood between Barnes and Noble and Cary Town Center, moving towards the intersection of US 1, is just going downhill. And the reason it's going downhill is because the geography or the topo topology, I should use that word, on the south side is a little bit iffy for commercial development, but it isn't that that has prevented it ha from happening. It's what's been done in terms of the zoning criteria. And as the gentleman mentioned, two developers have looked at this and said, no way, we can't do this. Now, I've talked to my neighbors. I live on Fairlane. We're in the Hillsdale Forest subdivision, and we're off from Kingston Ridge, which is right next to that southbound US-1 on-ramp. And all of us want to see redevelopment in this area, healthy redevelopment. Um, there's only going to be so many chances for this to occur. The way the economy is, the way commercial development is going, the way office development is going, it's not like the roaring 70s or the roaring 80s or even the roaring 90s. Um, if I owned a piece of property that was adjacent to a trailer park, and I hate to just sound negative when I use the phrase trailer park, but let's be honest, folks, this is the way people put together uh, what a property is going to sell for. They look at what's going on in the adjacent area and what's contiguous to the property. And I'd much rather have a new, fully developed set of townhomes adjacent to my property than have it looking at a trailer park. And it's not a brand new trailer park at that. So, and these are fairly large lots on Sturdivant. And most of the lots within that development are treed, the adjacent lots to this parcel are treed. And like any lot, in the wintertime, you lose your leaves. You can see your neighbor. Your neighbor can see you. I don't care whether you're one story or two story. And then spring comes along, the buds come out, the leaves come out. And by gory, 25 feet of trees makes a pretty good obstruction. May not be total, but it's there. So I'm not worried about the, the buffers here. The only thing that worries me about this particular development is the gentleman mentioned the fact that traffic is an issue and this sits one house lot away from the light at Sturdivant. And that light does calm traffic down. There's another light at uh, Nottingham and uh, Lawrence that calms that traffic down somewhat. Uh, but it, it is going to be a little bit of a problem for people to make a left-hand turn and head towards uh, US-1. Uh, but that exists in the present. It would continue to exist were these townhomes. I'd like to implore my fellow board members to really rethink where they're going with this because there are so few opportunities left to really do something with this corridor. And it has been in limbo for quite some time, as the gentleman mentioned earlier, who got up and spoke. And most of these properties are going downhill. 
And frankly, the, the idea that this is an individual give me, we do, we've done changes to our zoning ordinances for things like the downtown area. We've changed um, the spacing for people to add to a deck or a sun porch and, and change the amount of distance between the home and the property line. So I don't feel like we're doing something uh, for one individual here and we don't do it anywhere else. We have done it elsewhere. So uh, this is my reason for supporting uh, Mark's motion. Uh, again, I'd like to implore each and every one of you to kind of rethink this thing because there are only so many ways to get into downtown Cary and I'd like to have them on the improve rather than in the other direction. Thank you. Other comments? Well, I'm going to close it. Oh, just talk, a, a point of clarification. Uh, when I stated that I was not going to support this amendment, it was not because I do not support the uh, development of this area, be it townhomes or, or uh, single family homes or duplexes, whatever may go in there. My concern is the fact that we're reducing buffer um, and I believe very strongly that there can be a, a development plan put together with increased buffers, whether it's back to the 40 foot as it originally was or some other uh, mutually agreed upon number there and still be able to develop um, townhomes or some other residential areas in there. So I'm not opposed to, to that development and then certainly I am in favor of uh, providing a good and very uh, viable gateway to the town of Cary, but I, I do really have that concern over the buffers. Not, I'm not opposed to the redevelopment. Well, I guess it's up to me to pipe in. Um, I suffer a little, oh, I'm sorry, we can't take any more input now, sir. Uh, thank you, that's just a quick clarification. I, I apologize. It's just, it's I'm, I'm sorry, we, we, can't, we, we've closed the public hearing. Um, I'm suffering a little bit from being around too long. I remember when we first developed the plan for this quarter, and I think there were some grand expectations. Um, and unfortunately, most of them haven't been realized. We, um, we thought that this was going to be a really interesting kind of boutique commercial kind of corridor with, with uh, smaller commercial facilities. And, and um, the reality is that it just never worked. It, it didn't pass the business sniff test. And so uh, we didn't get it right. And so now we have to figure out how to get it right. Um, do I like this, this amendment? Not really. I'd rather see bigger buffers. However, would I like to see something happen on this parcel that's been sitting there now for, well, I've been looking at it for 13 years, and I'm sure it's been there much longer than that. Um, I'd like to see something happen here. Um, I can't tell you whether it's commercially viable with smaller buffers, but I can tell you that I've seen us relieve buffers elsewhere. And this is a unique situation, as is downtown. This quarter is unique because we kind of created this unique problem, I don't know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever it was. And, um, and we have some obligation to be a little bit more flexible, trying to figure out um, a problem we created with all good intentions that just didn't work out. So I am going to pro support the motion. And if there's no other comments. I'd like to make one. Um, I haven't lived here as long as other people. And so I didn't know some of the things that, Chairman, that you brought up and Wayne, that you brought up. Um, and I'm not comfortable with the buffer 
the reduction in the buffer. But some of the, uh, about what the Walnut Street Quarter was supposed to do and this and that, I, I wasn't aware of it. And for that reason, I am gonna change my mind and I'm gonna support it. I don't like the buffer. I, I wish they would go with a 40 foot buffer, but I, I agree that this area um, needs a, a shot in the arm. It needs some improvement. And for a, a, an avenue into the town of Cary, I think it's, it has potential. Well, then I feel obligated to make one more comment. I was on the board when we created this. Oh, that's order. right. You were, yes, I as was old here. As I am, aren't you? I am at least as old as you are. Um, the objective here was to provide some type of buffer for the residents who were not immediately facing Walnut Street while providing some viability for the unfortunate souls who owned homes on Walnut Street when we widened it. Um, I still believe that that is a good intention, is to try to protect, give some type of protection to the homes that are in this second tier, you know, the second row back. And so, you know, I, I think that was a lot of the reason why we came up with a special quarter. It was special but the intent was not to take away protection. So, and you know, you put it very well. I, I think townhomes would be fine here. I just don't, as I said before, don't believe that the people in this area deserve any less protection than people in other areas of town. So, all right. All right. If there are no other comments, I'm gonna call this to the vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. And this aye. one we need hands on. Okay, I have that to be, I got only five. Those opposed? No. Or this motion carries five to four. And now we're gonna move on to cases that do not require a public hearing and we're gonna start with 14 REZ 28, which is the Laquina Road South. Mr. Chairman, yes. before we start, I need Technical difficulty. I lost my agenda. Um, we, I think, have a technical difficulty on one of our computers here, and um, lest we require you to work in the dark, um, I think we're going to take a five-minute no, break a, to. That's a internet. We're going to take a five-minute break to facilitate human factors and to fix bits. <laughs> See, there's a... Uh, and to be clear, I said five, not six minutes. Mm, I don't know if you answered answer to your question. Yeah, the clock is running. You mm -hmm. couldn't get in the bracket. <laughs>
I'm going to call us back to order. And now we're going to get on to REZ, uh, 14 REZ 28, which is the Vakina Road South presentation from Ms. Granite. Thank you. This is the rezoning request for an assemblage of properties located on Joaquina Road, uh, totaling approximately 14.58 acres. Subject parcels are highlighted here in yellow on the south side of Joaquina Road. Carrie's land use plan designation for the property is medium density residential. The existing zoning is residential 40. The proposed zoning is R8, residential eight, conditional use. Conditions proposed by the applicants would limit dense, the use to detached residential and limit the density to 3.1 dwelling units per acre. Shows you the notification area. There were no protest petitions. Um, staff's observation and concern regarding this assemblage of properties didn't pertain to the use or the density, but an observation that we've had with a number of rezoning cases in this area, and that's the Highcroft Collector Avenue. And this is a slide that gives you an overview of what's been going on out here in the area. Uh, you may be familiar with the uh, YMCA site that was approved. The Indian Wells properties in the pink have been approved. Um, the Phillips property rezoning case. Um, there's the Joaquina Road rezoning case, which is still in review. And then these parcels here tonight, the purple, the, um, the subject property. The dash blue line shows the proposed collector, Highcroft Avenue, um, Highcroft Collector Avenue. So the concern has been that it's problematic if you're getting bits and pieces of development in this area and not getting something more comprehensive. So it's a concern that we've raised before um, about skipping over some of the property and, and not having an assemblage that allows for development along this major collector. Uh, this slide shows that a uh, portion of one of the parcels Im is impacted by a stream buffer according to our GIS maps. Field determination of this would be required at the time of development plan review. And there's a proposed greenway trail that would follow that collector avenue that I just mentioned shown in the dash blue line that's not actually on any of the subject properties of this particular rezoning case. Uh, Carries transportation plan identifies Morrisville Parkway and NC 55 as major thoroughfares and Joaquina Road as a collector road. And then Highcroft Avenue is a future collector avenue. Closest transit route is a triangle transit route on NC 55. And this concludes staff's presentation. Uh, the a representative for the property owners is here tonight um, to speak to the request and then I'll be available for your questions. Mr. Chairman, board, good evening. My name is Michael Somerville and I live at 1404 Wakenna Road. <coughs> uh, myself, as well as my neighbors, the New Kirks, the Lewis and Mr. James Duke, um, requested our current zoning of R40 be changed to R8 CU. Other properties on our street are currently undergoing the same rezoning proposals, and it is with that in mind that we submit our property to undergo the same reasonable consideration with our proposed rezoning and in accordance with the Northwest Area Plan. The current comprehensive plan for the Northwest site recommends this area be used for medium density residential development. Our request is submitted to maintain this, the MDR status with this rezoning. The benefits to the proposed rezoning of R8CU will keep a similar look and feel to the subject properties consistent with the rezoning taking place all around it. This area is predominantly single family homes and this proposal is to keep the same consistent development pattern in the area. Having the subject properties rezoned at this time will keep these four properties compatible and consistent with the zoning request of our 14 neighbors with their rezoning request 14-REZ-08. With this in mind, we ask for the board's support. Thank you. There being no public hearing, we can open this up for questions from the board. 
When you said the other area was under review still, what did that mean? Has not been a, there's not been a final determination on that yet. Okay. There's not been a vote yet. It hasn't gone back to town council for a final vote. Planning and Zoning Board recommended it for approval, but it has not had a final vote yet. It's um, listed as tabled on the website. Mm -hmm. We anticipate it coming back in April or May. The applicant is working on some new zoning conditions, so. Can you go back to slide 101? I believe Which one? That's the one that showed the uh, collector road. Do we have any um, input on the two properties that are left that are not coming in? I mean, was there, do we Not yet, no. We, we don't have an applicant for those at this time. So my concern, you know, is, is the same as, you know, staff expressed, mm -hmm. is that we are putting all this you know, we're doing all these rezonings or reviewing these rezonings or whatever state they're in, and yet we are not, the infrastructure that's required to support them isn't keeping up, you know, and I, I really get concerned when I see a property basically being circled and not taken in. And I, I don't know if my fellow board members realize this, but Collector roads aren't built by the town or the state. They're built by the owner of the property. So if as you narrow this down to this one parcel of property, you know, the cost of the road, you know, is, is debited against the price of this property, which is, you know, financial issues that we shouldn't be concerned about. But it also makes it unlikely that we would ever get that piece of road without some type of condemnation. We don't want to go there. So I, this bits and pieces is a concern for me. Now, because people said I'm not leaving ever, you know, that's a different thing. That's why I was asking if we had any perspective from, from the owners of that property. Well, I recall it's a conversation we had with um, Zero Eight was <coughs> that exact thing and, and the uh, blank property to the north of 08 has a, a serious stream mitigation that has to be done as well if you're going to bring a collector road through there. And there was some, we expressed some great concern at that time uh, about what you just said, that, you know, unless this is a much larger piece, the likelihood of that collector road being finished off. In fact, there's a pretty good uh, description of that on the staff report as well. Um, can I appreciate the these people that are in purple on this map are the last to come to the table, and I don't want to put them in a disadvantage just due to timing, but can we table this whole thing till maybe town council looks at the whole big picture there? Maybe that's what they're doing? Well, I believe we have the option to, to vote on a tabling. Um, I think that will be somewhat punitive to the applicants in this case, because we're saying, because of something that is happening not on your property, somewhere else, we're going to basically put you in abeyance and, and so going to force you to wait. So when we something, what is it? It just makes them wait, but okay. Lisa, did you have some observation on the tabling? Just as to the issue of timing, um, under the LDO, there are some time limits on your action, and if you don't act in a timely manner, the council could take action without your recommendation. Um, I believe it's it's a 90-day time frame, the exact wording of when you start counting the 90 days. I don't, I didn't pull it up and look at it, but that's just something to think about if you're considering tabling. And we're probably 30 days into that now since the town council meeting? Because um, that's not I'm not sure. I would have to go back and check. I recall seeing this one about a month ago in town council. And the wording of the ordinance is exactly when we start counting. I haven't looked back at that to figure that out. So it's just something to think about. 
I see it, or at least as a way to frame this slightly differently than we're looking at one property and making a decision on another. I look at it more in terms of consistency. The, the town council at the tabling at their meeting, and, and, and since it was said in a council meeting, I think I can recount it here. Uh, someone mentioned, you probably don't have the votes. Would you like to see us table this? Mm -hmm. And the applicant had no problem with it being tabled. So if it's being tabled in the, in the nature of maybe assimilating all of these things into one giant coherent piece that can be looked at, because there, there's a lot of discussion about the school impacts and the traffic mm -hmm. impacts with this. Um, if there's any way to, to facilitate bundling these together, um, and in fairness to these, to the current applicant before us today, these four properties, they, they have every right to be heard like they've asked. In the same manner as 08, they're asking for 3.1 dwelling units per acre. That's what 08 is asking for. I mean, it's, it's very, very similar in all cases. And so I would probably say the same loose condition applies that you may want to think about tabling this thing rather than seeing it shot down. Now, I'm not saying it will be, but that, that, was the, that was the way 08 was described at council. And I don't even know if that's our decision to make or if council would make that sort of and decision. And if they do want to override us in 90 days, then so be it. They made a bigger decision and look at the bigger picture. Nancy, could you do me a favor? Sure. Could you bring your microphone down? Oh, sure. Sorry. I'm the geezer with the hearing aids. Oh, sorry. So. Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying if we do table it and town council does decide in 90 days that they've looked at the big <coughs> picture, then they can scoop this up and do what they want. Another, another option you might wish to consider, and I just checked with one of the applicants, you could make a recommendation um, but that we could delay taking this until it goes at the same town council meeting as the 14 REZ08 so that council could evaluate both of them. Uh, either in April or May. I, that's my thought. Was, mm -hmm. I'd rather see a table by the, the town. Yeah, council I don't, I don't want us to handcuff them. Right. So pass it up and mm -hmm. let well, them act. And on. I but, think that allows some coordination between this mm -hmm. and the other cases. Mm -hmm. You know, if we table it, we're not exactly sure how to coordinate it. Whereas if we buck it along to town council, they now at least have one point of review for mm -hmm. all of these. Right. And we approved 08, so. That would be the course of action. Before I got on. Pardon me? Before I got on. <laughs> but the, I guess I'm troubled by a couple of things here. First of all, um, you got to be fair. Just because these guys were a couple months after the guys right next to them, do you treat them different? Particularly because you're not sure what the aggregate impact is? Well, that, that's fundamentally unfair to the property owner, I think. On the other hand, um, we've got all of this kind of coming in, in, in bundles, and the aggregate, aggregate effect I think we all kind of feel is going to be one large development that got approved in pieces, but the impact on things like traffic and schools will not be in pieces, it'll be an aggregate. Um, I expect that, well, I know that these three parcels will not require a TIA, which is something we've talked about before and we're actually talking in our work session about changing the criteria for requirement for a TIA. Um, it troubles me that we are reviewing these without being able to really appreciate the aggregate impact but until we change the LDO to define our requirements for TIA, I think, or I should say traffic impact analysis for those that aren't familiar with our acronyms, um, I, I think we got to go with what we've got. Um, there was a mention about that parcel that the road is going through, and you know, you're absolutely right, Carla. It's going to be very hard for that property owner to sell that parcel to anybody but DOT, when DOT has to complete that road, or carrying on DOT. But I expect that at the time they'll ar they will argue hardship that it, they can't subdivide their parcel with a right-of-way going through the middle of it, and so they'll end up 
to getting the whole thing probably sold, but we don't know how that's going to sort out. And then, frankly, that parcel isn't what we're talking about tonight. That, that parcel is, you know, we might get to talk about that sometime in the future. We might not. What we really need to do is give a fair review to the parcels that we are talking about. Yeah, I think my, my concern is not so much for that particular property owner, but the um, appearance that, you know, we have non-adjacent parcels that seem to be skirting around a very expensive problem. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I don't know how I feel about that right now. I'm not sure we have a solution to it. To be exactly. Yeah. Do we have any other thoughts, comments, or? Just thank you very much to the planning department for that graphic. That's very, mm -hmm. very helpful. That helps a mm -hmm. lot. A lot, exactly. It, it does give you a sense for what we've been doing in the last few months. And I think we've all had this nagging knot in our stomachs about how all this stuff is cumulatively combining. And this kind of puts it into perspective. And having driven through here, I can understand their desire to just get a move on and, and get the rezoning and, and let yep. things develop. Well, if we have no other comments, I'd love to have a motion. From someone. Well, I'm a someone. <laughs> So, Mr. Chairman, I move that the board forward case number 14REZ28 to town council with a recommendation for approval. As it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans, and is reasonable and in the public interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and the presentation. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion. Well, I made the motion. For consistency's sake, for fairness's sake, let's let's put this forward. And and I think the the recommendation to put this all in front of town council in, in one cohesive unit as much as we can is great to finally air these these types of issues out once and for all. So this is a step in that process, and I'm happy to be part of it. Good. Good. Al. Wait, 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 wait a second. Yeah, I've, I've, I've made this mistake once. I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> I'll just second the comments that were iterated here. What I wanted to ask you is you mentioned something. Some, we mentioned having it delayed so that it goes to town council. Should that have been part of the motion? So it goes to the town council when they also see the one that's under review? We did talk about that. Did we have to build so that they could motion? look at it as a whole. I just didn't know if that needed to be a part I'd, of the motion. I've already made a note of it and talked to the applicant, and they were comfortable with waiting until April or May. So, okay, we'll we'll certainly all right take care of that. Okay. Other comments? In that case, well, I, okay. Well, come on. I wasn't here for 08, so I'm not trying to punish the last person to the table. And I, but in being consistent, I would like a bigger picture of this whole thing looked at. So. I will do the favor of taking the hit for the team and saying, no, <laughs> I'm not in favor of this. Not that I'm trying to, but I'm just not in favor of this whole piecemeal approach. So I don't want it to look like we're uniformly saying, yay, go do it. So, yeah. And I know you'll say something, but I just don't feel comfortable voting for it. And I think Nancy and I are operating off the same brain tonight. I think I'm going to, I feel the same way. I, I feel like we need to see it as a comprehensive piece, and I'm not comfortable with a piece here and a piece there. Um, well, the good when news, that happens to, you know, leave some islands of the good news is should the two of you vote against the motion, at least we're ensured it isn't on consent. That's and right. Of course, the town council to absolutely That's right. consider it. Um, lacking other comments, all those in favor of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Motion opposed. Okay, no. that, that motion carries seven to two, I believe. Thank you. And we're going to move on to 14 REZ 30 Weldon Ridge. 
This item <clears throat> is a request to annex and apply initial town of Cary zoning to about eight acres. It's located at 1052, 1056, and 1100 Furson Road. This is a vicinity map. Uh, you can see the property is located on, at the uh, end of Furston Road, which extends from Marsville Parkway and then uh, dead ends at the property. Um, there is not a road connection um, with Furston Road to, to East Farrell Road, which is to the west. The American Tobacco Trail is uh, immediately adjacent along the west side. The existing zoning of this site is, uh, for the most part, R30 in Wake County. There is a small portion that is zoned um, Plan Development District and is in the Weldon Ridge Plan Development. This, site, uh, this slide shows the boundary of the site in relation to the entirety of the Weldon Ridge um, PDD, and you can see it's at the very uh, bottom corner. To the east is the Copper Leaf Reserve subdivision, and to the north uh, in this portion, and um, uh, also in the PDD for Weldon Ridge, is the Montvale uh, site plan. This is a site plan that has been uh, recently approved by town council, and here you can see where the property is in relation to that and how those uh, connections could work. This is the existing master plan for the Weldon Ridge PDD. Um, you, the subject property is down in the southern um, portion. It does abut the um, PDD. The proposed zoning would bring all of the, the parcel, including these, um, these two por this portion and this portion, would come into the plan development district. The zoning conditions that are proposed include um, land uses that would allow up to 12 detached dwellings with the minimum lot size of 15,000 square feet. Now, I'll point out this is consistent with the um, requirements in the very low density portion of the conservation uh, residential um, overlay district, which this is part of. This shows the PDD master plan, if amended, uh, shows picking up this area in the southern portion. It would also reconfigure the boundary between um, the existing uh, tract SF9 and the uh, new tract SF11, which is what the new um, property would, would be. This shows the southwest area plan. You can see, uh, as I mentioned, the site is in the conservation residential area uh, up in the corner here and the zoning conditions that they're proposing uh, are consistent with the um, uh, policy set forth <coughs> and the requirements in the conservation residential area. Since this is in a planned development district, they do set their own uh, standards as part of the district. The site does have uh, some impact for stream buffers according to Cary's GIS maps. Field determination of this would be made at the time of the uh, development plan review. You can see the Cary Parks and Greenways plan to the, to the west between the site and Farrell Road. You can see the American Tobacco Trail. And then there are proposed, uh, proposed Greenway Trail to the, um, not on the subject property, but in the vicinity to the east. According to the transportation plan, Morrisville Parkway is um, a major thoroughfare. And then you can see Green Hope School Road as well. No protest petition was submitted for the property. There were no uh, speakers at the public hearing other than the applicant. And that concludes staff's comments. I'll be glad to answer any questions. I have I guess one question about. Um, but oh. Let's wait until we hear from the applicant and then oh, we'll so come back for questions. Good evening. Glenda Taub with Glenda S. Taub and Associates. I'm going to be brief since it's 
since it's late, um, and Ms. Bierman did an excellent job going over what's being proposed. Um, it is an amendment to the existing Weldon Ridge PDD. Um, the maximum number of units that we're asking for is 12. Um, the maximum density is 1.5 dwelling units per acre. Um, we are, as part of the PDD document, complying with the requirements of the Southwest Area Plan, very low conservation overlay district. Um, there are other parts within Weldon Ridge, as pointed out in the staff report, that came in the same way with conditions um, requiring that any development comply with the standards of the Southwest Area Plan, and, and this development is no different. Um, no one spoke at the public hearing. Also want to point out that the development will provide a connection to the American Tobacco Trail that runs adjacent to the property. Um, we believe that the proposed zoning and the conditions attached to this project um, makes, it, makes it very suitable for this property and consistent with the development that is adjacent to it. And we ask for your support and I'm here to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Nancy. Oh, I just had a, and not a question about, when they said this house was not located in the historic, so you know that new historic board we have? They've already know about this and already, so this has already been covered? I think they're, uh, they, correct me if I'm wrong, and staff help me here, Jeff. I think they have an inventory that was originally done by Wake County that they're taking over responsibility for. And so they already have kind of a... So our new board agrees with the Wake County Yeah, list. Yeah, I, I, I think they probably have just taken it over as it was, and then they're going to, I'm sure in time, evolve. Okay, so this one's not slipping through the crack or anything. Um, that doesn't that, seem like it would. I'm just curious about how this works. Uh, it was reviewed um, <clears throat> by the staff to, oh, okay. to see if it was on the inventory. Okay. So and the staff decided it was not, or? Um, no, it says it, it was not, so they're okay with it. I just want to make sure it was okay with our new yeah. board that just got and doesn't get. Yes, it was looked at. The, the inventory has been updated. Okay. So we, uh, we have an inventory that's now the town of Cary's inventory that we look at. Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Other questions? I know they asked this at town council, but I didn't really understand the answer about Fairson Road. That will remain gravel between this site and the developed one? It would be upgraded. Uh, it would need to be upgraded to be um, a surface that would, an improved surface that would support emergency vehicles uh, and provide for two-way traffic. There would be some improvement uh, that would be needed um, in addition to improvements on the frontage of the site to make sure that there is a continuous route with the proper service uh, surface all the way to where the pavement currently ends. Okay, so Fairson is going to be. It would be improved. It may not. It may not be improved to the full cross section that will ultimately be be done as all the other intervening properties develop over time. But it would the developer for this site because it is um, very. Um, I mean it basically looks more like a gravel lane as it goes up to the property. So there would have to be um, more improvements to make that connection so that there would be a continuous um, paved surface that met our requirements. Okay. Other questions? We're slowing down. <laughs> yeah. In that case is is someone prepared to make a motion? I'll make a motion that um, I move that the board forward case number 14-REZ-30 to town council with a recommendation for approval as it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans and is reasonable and in the public interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and presentation. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, discussion? Carla. 
think I'm familiar with this place, though. I'm pretty sure my sister lived in a trailer on this lot. <laughs> Speaking of trailers. Well, I, I guess I'll add to, to that. that. <laughs> I don't think I can top that, but um, <laughs> um, I, my reason for, uh, for second this is, um, of course, I'm on board with it. Um, I think the density looks good, and I think overall it looks like a pretty good project, so definitely in support of it. Would anyone else like to give me anything else that can I report to town council? <laughs> I guess I still have a question about the first and road, but I like it. But I kind of confused. I know you got an answer, but it's still not. And maybe it's the hour. Um, is it going to be improved, and who's maintaining it? But, but um, currently, it's it's a NCDOT road. It is within an existing right of way. Um, the standard to which the road is built, though, right now, is just a gravel road that functions much like a more like a driveway to get um, to the rear to where the um, this property is. So it is a DOT road, but it's not built to the standards that we require. So for the development to utilize that road as part when the time for the subdivision plan comes, they will need, they will be required to improve the road so that they have the proper access uh, for emergency vehicles, fire vehicles, so they can get from Morrisville Parkway to the site on uh, an adequate surface and to provide for two-way traffic. I believe the width of that is approximately 22 feet, but that's um, <clears throat> that's just a re the re developer of this property would be required to do that in order to have adequate access to okay. the property. Okay. Thanks. Then, just so I have it clear in my head, um, because the properties to the north are already developing, couldn't they access this property from a road that is developed from the north? Um, I'm, I'm going to let her finish and then I'll let you talk about it. Um, there, will be, there would be connections to the adjacent property. Um, there, the exist, there is an existing right of way that provides um, access to the site, and I guess I would ask if you know if transportation staff has anything in addition to add to that. But oh, or sorry. I'll add an. It, it's cold in here. I don't know if y'all are cold, but that's a. Another that statement you like yours in the tie. It's is that what you came down to tell us? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, um, it's getting late. There at, are con at nine forty at night. You came down to talk about the <laughs> right. temperature. It's chilly in here. Um, with this one of the slides that was shown before, um, there are road stubs from existing subdivisions that are planned or under construction that this will tie into also. So first and road is not. I guess not the that. only access point for the property. Okay. Great. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those. Did you have something else, Nancy? No, You're looking at me I'm like, just wait a second. sighing. No, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Did, did, was that a no? No, I, I'm not opposing. So. Oh, you, you, you did one of these. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that I, was I, unanimous. I said, I, I said, that was unanimous, yes, right? Yes. And now we're going to move on to our last case for the evening, and that's um, LDO Amendment Round 30B through H. <laughs> Okay, these are the remainder of the round 30 items. Uh, this is just for discussion. A public hearing, as I mentioned before, is not required on these items. Uh, again, the tentative schedule, these were um, presented at the town council public hearing in January. You discussed them at your work session in February and uh, following a recommendation, if one is given this evening, it would be moved forward to the town council in April. There were uh, a number of items in round 30. Uh, we have already addressed item A, 
Um, and then we'll go through each of the remaining um, items, B through H. The details are provided in your staff report, background information, and the ex uh, exact proposed text. Item B, uh, first item to discuss um, is electronic gaming or electronic sweepstakes. This amendment would create a new use classification and use specific standards that would address uh, this use and uh, with electronic gaming operations and also individual machines. The amendment seeks to establish where the use would be allowed and it uh, includes use specific standards for that so that we would um, ensure compatibility with existing neighborhoods. It's proposed to allow this as a principal use in the general commercial, the industrial, and the office research and development district, or the portion of the ORD within the airport overlay only, and also within the commercial subdistrict of the town center. And a zoning compliance permit would be required so we could track where these are because there are some uh, standards that we would need to, to make sure that we're aware of related to spacing. In the general commercial industrial and the ORD districts, a 500 foot separation would be required from residential user zoning, daycare facilities, schools, religious assembly, and any other electronic gaming operation. In the commercial subdistrict sub of the town center, the 500 foot separation would only apply between um, to electronic gaming operations and the separations from the other uses would not apply. Uh, other standards include um, parking requirements. We'd be establishing uh, a number of uh, parking places related to the number of machines um, and the square footage of the floor area and the um, number of, per, or the number of people um, based on fire rated capacity. And also with these, these uses, no alcohol would be served. We are aware of two existing businesses within town. Both of these are within the commercial subdistrict or the town center. We've looked at the location of these and the separation requirement between um, like uses is met with both of these existing uh, facilities. So if the ordinance was adopted, the two existing con uh, uses uh, could be permitted. This is a map that shows the town center zoning district. You can see the um, commercial subdistricts are shown in the red area. There's one here um, and this area and then down across from um, the train station. And here you can see the separation between um, these potential areas. There's about 1,900 feet between um, these two commercial areas and then about 2,200 feet between these areas. The blue stars show the two uh, approximate location of the existing facilities and those are uh, over 500 feet, about 530, 550 feet apart. We would also allow the use of mach uh, machines uh, on a limited basis as an accessory use. That would be allowed in the general commercial district and in the commercial subdistrict of the town center. Uh, legal conforming uh, uses there could have up to four machines as an accessory use and the separation requirements would not apply in those areas and the accessory use permit requirement would still apply. The next item, uh, item C, is a clarification with some of the text just to clarify the intent of the ordinance to uh, ensure that rezonings and other development decisions are consistent with the land use plan. This is not really a substantive change, but it does <clears throat> clarify <clears throat> excuse me, clarify the wording with regard to that consistency. Item D relates to transportation system requirements. Um, the main purpose of this item is to address some of the concerns that are related to cumulative traffic impacts. Um, currently, uh, traffic impact analysis is required at the rezoning stage if the use would generate more than 100 peak hour trips. 
With this amendment, we would require a TIA for rezonings proposed within 400 feet of an active rezoning case or property that was rezoned within the previous 18 months if the cumulative trip generation exceeds 100 peak hour trips. And you may recall we discussed this quite a bit at the work session. Uh, based on the discussion and your concerns, we did increase um, the separation requirement from contiguous, which was in the original proposal, to the 400 feet that's proposed here, and the time period increased from 12 months to 18 months. Um, also, the, there's a provision that um, clarifies or specifies that no improvements would be required at intersections that already uh, were designed and constructed to meet the requirements of the Comprehensive Transportation Plan. It also has some text to clarify the approval authority for development plans that require a traffic study, uh, whether that be the planning director uh, versus a town council, and would also extend the expiration date of traffic impact analysis from three to five years, uh, as this matches the planning horizon that's contained within a TIA. Next item includes three different amendments that are related to signs. The first pertains to sign colors and would allow a periodic change of wall sign color for non-residential buildings five stories or taller. This amendment was initiated in response to a request by MetLife. Um, the, it's proposed to have a maximum of 12 colors that would be specified on a master sign plan with a, um, the, um, or the text includes a minimum of eight hours between color changes. Uh, there's nothing um, too special about an eight hour limit. It's really intended to ensure that there's no blinking of the lights, that, they're, um, that um, we do need to have a minimum to ensure that there's no blinking. We, this is not included in the actual text, but we do recommend a maximum of 12 color changes per year as well. Just uh, There may be some challenges with enforcement of that, but at least to have on the books that we want to have a limitation on the number of times per year that these changes could occur. Another amendment would allow two temporary banners for new businesses as long as no more than one could be seen from any given vantage point. This would just uh, provide a little bit more flexibility when businesses are open and uh, uh, first opening uh, or making some changes to, to have a little more visibility temporarily. And also would clarify that signs on architectural features may not extend above the roof line of a building. We also have several uh, changes that are related to specific uses in their use-related standards uh, sections. We would uh, propose to eliminate the minimum density requirement in activity centers, also allow portions of the town center where retail use is allowed uh, to um, or allow light industrial uses in areas where retail uses are allowed within the town center, provided that goods produced on the site are sold there. And that addresses some of the um, issues with the brewery, for example, where, where there's a combination of retail use and some sort of industrial type use to um, encourage that. There's also an amendment related to rental of passenger vehicles where that would be allowed by right in general shopping centers with some limitations and uh, requirements related to parking availability and prohibiting any signs on the vehicles to, to minimize any sign clutter. And also a proposal to allow a wellness center as a permitted use in an industrial district. Item G includes several changes related to minor modifications. Uh, this would allow the planning director to make a decision on a minor modification that he would um, be authorized to make even if the site plan itself required action by town council. An example of this could be uh, decision, certain decisions related to champion tree removal or parking reductions that fell within the limits of what the planning director is authorized to do. It would also 
increase the uh, percentage change that the planning director would be authorized to make from 10 to 15 percent for a numerical standard such as a setback requirement. And whereas the town council would um, be able to make a numerical change uh, up to 30 percent, uh, which is a slight increase above the 25 percent that they're allowed to make now. And the transportation and facility director would be able to reduce the width of a right-of-way uh, dedication that was required by up to 5 percent based on uh, requirements or um, criteria found under our minor alteration section. And the town council could um, reduce the width if it was more than 5 percent. Item H includes a number of technical and minor amendments, procedural changes. Uh, there's quite a few of those. I'll be glad to go over, there, go over those individually if you like. Um, but I think we had discussion about those at the work session as well. That concludes my comments. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you. Do we have questions? <clears throat> I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Please. Um, in relation to the uh, electronic gaming operations, the five foot, the 500 foot separation, how was that um, distance determined? I, I noticed that uh, several of the counties where um, they have more of a proliferation of this potential um, issue, their their ordinances are a thousand foot separation. So, can you elaborate on how? Uh, the 500 foot separation was determined. We were trying to find, um, make sure that there was an, enough separation so that there um, were provided the protections uh, from the uses that we felt may not be as compatible with this, while at the same time trying to ensure that there was enough area that would be available um, so that we were on, on safe ground with. Um, since there's some protections associated with these, that we were on safe ground with not, in effect, prohibiting the use. So it was trying to kind of uh, find that balance. With item um, about the traffic study, can we take into the use of land occasionally as to what, again, the topic I keep coming up with was the schools, the peak hour really is not later in the day. It's later in the mid-afternoon. I don't know if we can do that, but I don't know. That was just my comment about what they consider peak hours, mm -hmm. maybe consider the use of the land. You might look at it differently if there's a school. Um, and the other one was item B with the, again, the gaming. I am, I understand that I don't want to put anybody out of business, but can you go back to that map for a second? Okay, and that was? The gaming, the map of Chapel Hill Road with the red areas. That was B. There was a map. Let's see, there's one. It's a bigger map. Yeah. No, keep going. It was later. I'm sorry. I should have noted the page number. I should see that now. Okay. It was later. It was like 138, 9, 139, maybe. 139. Hmm. Oh, maybe 140. 140. Oh, there you go. There sorry. That, see that little middle red one? Is that blue one there, a school, elementary school, to the upper left, northwest corner of that one? Yeah, right um, there. That blue area there, is that an elementary school? I just don't like it being that close to an elementary school. Um, Nothing, I don't I, want to put them out of business, but. I believe that is a school. Yes. Kingswood, yeah. I think. It would still have to be 500 feet from the school, I believe. That's for not, the school. Not in the not, not in this center. district. Okay. Not in that small district. I and that's not where the existing um, the existing businesses are in the red parcel to the east, yeah. <laughs> to the right. The existing one. Oh, there's not that little red section right there. That is a commercial subdistrict of the town center, but that's not where the existing businesses are located. Just but it to could be, clear. be one there, though. Yes. That's what I'm worried about. Yes. I'm just saying I don't like that. Sorry. Or it couldn't. 
It couldn't because there, it would be five, within 500 feet of no, the No, they school. did the distances and it worked, didn't it? On that other map where you show the distances, it would these, work. These, the, the distances work with, um, yeah, so that's maybe. Here, these are, these are more than 500 feet. There are approximately one here and one here. Um, so they could put it there. I'm not liking it. Right, so these, really? there's about uh, 2,200 feet of separation between these two so commercial areas. So that could areas. be an area so that, that would, gaming. There would be the potential, there couldn't be more than one in this, in, within this area, but the potential would exist to have one there uh, within this area. Next to a school. Yes. Okay. You, you mentioned accessory use mm -hmm. would be allowed in facilities that weren't primarily these e gaming parlors. Would that include well, allowing these in a bar? Pardon? Would that, uh, uh, you said that they would be allowed as an accessory use. It's an accessory use in other businesses. In other words, businesses. Would that include bars? They could. The, the alcohol sort of limitation doesn't apply to the accessory use. You may, the play, we, I, I believe there's about seven that we're aware of within the town. Um, there may be several in restaurants. I know there's several in convenience stores where there may be like one machine, one or two machines. So we are aware of a few of those. Other questions? I've got a question. <clears throat> In terms of uh, eliminating the minimum density for activity centers, this has kind of been a nightmare of mine ever since we kind of talked about this. And, and I guess my question is, it, it seems kind of, kind of counterintuitive that all of a sudden the reason for having an activity center is now kind of obliviated by the fact that we don't say, all right, an activity center is representative of higher density, closer proximity to goods and services, uh, certain requirement of density would be emblematic or indicative of this. And now we're coming around to saying where well, we don't need this at all. And I guess my question just is, why are we doing this? Is this because of a trend that's going on out there? Well, one thing, this change would apply to detached dwellings, density for detached dwellings. And one of the issues that we've run across, when you have an area where the land use plan designation is medium density, which requires a minimum of three units per acre, in some cases, if you, had, if you have a site that is um, not impacted by any stream buffers, uh, it's you know, minimal uh, constraints, then it may well be uh, feasible to have a single family product with the density of um, three units per acre. However, because in our ordinance, we calculate density based on gross acreage, um, if a site is constrained, then it's literally, it may be literally impossible for a, for a developer to get enough single family units on a lot to achieve an overall density of three units per acre because you're, because you're taking out area that would be in roads. There's more, you know, a road network that's required for the, the detached, you know, the single family lot development. You know, you're staying out of stream buffers. Um, you're taking into account any regulatory open space, you know, that, that's outside of the individual lots. And what we found in several of the um, rezoning cases that we've had in the past year or so where this issue has come up is that uh, we've had several cases where developers were trying to do a single family product at three units per acre and because of the constraints on the property, it didn't work. Uh, they, they couldn't get that to fit on there. So it's sort of forced going into a plan amendment to lower the density for, or, or the, to change the plan designation to low density residential in order to build um, a detached product. So this was, so this was, um, a proposed change just in recognizing that where 
f for the um, low, the detached dwellings or single family development it's to try to get around the, the problem of trying to meet um, a minimum density when typically you have so many constraints that it's hard to, to get even to the minimum lot size and have um, enough lots to meet that threshold. I guess the thing that sort of made me curious was the Orem property, which we just talked about, we took out of an activity center because it was going to be a lower density and it didn't make sense. It would seem that with this change, it could have been developed and been part of an activity center. But then you're back to how do you know when you draw up the boundaries of an activity center whether or not they're really going to be viable mm -hmm. in the long term? And maybe that's one of the things that you have to recognize is and in, in could the, be fluid. Right. And in the case of the um, Orem example with that plan amendment as well, with taking that out of the center, um, currently with the community, the um, type of activity center that that's in, even though the plan designation was low density residential, the activity center requirements, it was because of being in the overlay district, it was required to have a minimum density of 3.5 units per acre and detached dwellings were required to be a special use permit. So it just created, um, you know, any number of, of issues in attempting to have detached dwellings as a component within the centers as part of the uh, residential component. So it just provides more flexibility for, for that type of use. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, <clears throat> back to the transportation requirements. Um, I'm not really comfortable that we accomplished what I was hoping to achieve with that. I mean, I'm, I think when we prescribe this so simply and so, um, you know, we have this laid out rule, I think there's a lot of opportunities to create the race to be the first guy in, to create some inequities. I mean, you could have a subdivision that goes in with 98 homes and, a, and some guy says, you know, I want to join this a year later with five more and he's got to do the analysis. So I think we were heading in the right direction. Um, I would almost, even though I'm not usually a real fan of letting um, building in a lot of flexibility. I think maybe this is one situation where it would be good if staff could look in, at a piece and use common sense. So if you've got somebody came in with a comprehensive plan amendment and then, he, and then they came in with part of it for rezoning and you know that the rest is going to also come in for rezoning. Or if, you know, somebody, the guy that does come in with five homes, it's not right to make him to do the analysis even if it pushes it to 103 units altogether. So if we're going to leave it like this, I'd like to see a little bit of flexibility for staff to be able to say, you know, in this case, you know, we either don't need to do it, you know, I'm just not comfortable with the way the it is. We were saying it was like if you trigger two out of three create conditions, but I don't know if that makes it simpler or works. Yeah, maybe I don't understand it. Well, I think, I think because, uh, because of the financial commitment and the costs that are involved in doing traffic studies that we would, we need to have specific <clears throat> criteria to look at now if those criteria included two out of three or some measure, but I think, uh, I think there would need to be specific criteria to look at rather than um, rather than a judgment call. I think that would be um, that would put staff in a very awkward position. And I think from the ordinance standpoint, we need to have criteria in making making those calls. But th would there there have been several uh, types of things in the ordinances that we have 
included that, you know, that include, a th you know, a more flexible threshold if it was two out of three requirements or, you know, if there was, we could certainly look to see if there was some, some possibility for moving in that direction. Yeah, it's very difficult a thing to resolve and I don't have the perfect answer, but, you know, I, I still see that the way we've got it set up could really um, create some issues for us. I, I share your heartburn on this one. I can see the poor guy that is generating 10 trips a day or 10 peak hour trips, um, but was late to the party, mm -hmm. getting stuck with the cost of TIA and effectively we're telling him you can't develop your property for 18 months until you get past this waiting period because the cost of the TIA or the number of lots you have would be prohibitive. <clears throat> Yeah, this is the only one I'm not comfortable with, and and I don't have the answer. And I, I, I would almost like to pull that one from this and vote on that separately, or table that item until round 31, and maybe have a little bit more chance to discuss it. Mark, you got but, but I still think the incentive that we talked about to get the developer. Uh, like if, if we just use the, the case we looked at earlier where it's just a few little parcels mm -hmm. that are adjacent to a much larger one, most likely the same developer is buying that whole thing. That The onus now is on the developer to be smart and say, let me reach out to everybody and try to get them on board now. And, and now I have a little more of a hammer. I can tell the stragglers, if you wait a year, you may be stuck with a TIA that you wouldn't be stuck with if, if you weren't. It, it was, it's sort of meant to be as an incentive to get that outreach to go without mm -hmm. forcing us to have to do it. So I, I don't want to lose that component of it. Yeah, I don't know if that's how it happens. I, I'm not I in the business. I don't either. I, I don't, you know. I, I'm know. more worried that that hammer becomes a hammer that the developer uses to hammer the last couple parcels that don't necessarily want to buy his offer, but now he can lowball them because he's got this TIA hammer. Right, my I mean, preference. No matter what we do, people are going to game it. Yeah. Our goal here is to get more TIAs where we know they're needed, um, and we've, we've not had them because of the peace <clears throat> effect. That's, and, and anything we can do to get to that end goal is, is a plus. Maybe if we put some minimum on the second, you know, the guy who pushes it over the limit, maybe he's only on the hook for doing the TIA if he's developing a certain minimum. And I don't know what the financial, you know, implications are, but, you know, five more, the five over doesn't what if we trigger added, it. Maybe 30 over triggers it. What if we added um, the transportation director can make a decision plus or minus 5%. So if it's 100 peak hours and somebody comes in with 98 and he says, oh, that's five, you know, here now it's 95, we're going to require a TIA. Right. That was the flexibility I was talking about, but staff doesn't seem to. Uh... We could always, mm -hmm. you know, continue to mention, I guess, when this goes to council, that you also talked about <clears throat> dropping it from 100 peak hour trips mm -hmm. to a lower number. And they may find that more palatable and easier to administer and, and just overall a much easier implementation. Uh -huh. I don't know. I'm not sure whether you were around when we arrived at that 100 peak hour no. trip. That was a um, that was a a challenging discussion when we finally evolved at that or arrived at that. Um, it's an arbitrary number, and no matter what number you pick, you can find some reason why it's not right. But you need to pick something. Um, most certainly, there are people that are gaming the system today and will game the system in the future. I think the anxiety that, the heartburn I'm having is, do we really step on the small property owner? Do we really penalize the individual property owner um, because he didn't buckle to a, an offer from a developer that was doing something bigger next to him? Yeah, it's a real word. And I'm not sure I want to give that developer that big a hammer. I'm not 
really well, see Well, that's what that. your time lag does. But, Matthew, let me help you. I, developer, come to you. You have a parcel that can maybe be 15 lots. Okay? And I say to you, you know, I'm going to develop this thing that's going to be 90 peak hour trips down the road. Um, in, or let's say 85 peak hour trips, whatever. And if you don't agree to sell me your dirt now, and you decide to develop it within the next 18 months or do it with somebody else, you're going to get stuck with the TIA. And that TIA is going to cost you $10,000, maybe. Oh, that's a, Mr. Johnson, is that about right, 10000 Somewhere in there. Okay. So unless you want to pay for that $10,000 TIA, you better agree to sell your dirt to me right now. It's not just the TIA. It's, it's all the uh, implications it's of all the, the report. It's all the implications as well, mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Because that's the second, second problem with this is I'm the guy with 10 peak hour trips and I do the TIA. But it, do I get stuck with all the mitigations? Well, is it the, the TIA or is it the fact that, oh, the roads and the, getting a voice in the planning and everything else? I think there's a bigger issue at hand here than just the TIA. I think my decision to come back to you would be like, well, maybe I want to if you're going to save me on making a road go to my property. So I think there's, I don't Mr. know. I think Benson's getting, coming up to straighten us out. Remember, right. tell, tell me the dog here. Well, I, I think you may want to keep in context too. We got we got a time commitment too. So, um, I think we had originally in the staff report it says the the second guy coming in, if as long as he stays after that twelve month window, you know, and he stays on a threshold, he doesn't have to do it. So I think he, you know, and then I think this board uh, may have suggested to go to eighteen months, but I think you know you might want to look at the window of opportunity. If if you have the little guy that really doesn't doesn't want to get held hostage. You know, he does have an out. He can wait a year. And then, you know, again, he, he's back in that same parameters. Is he going to do 100 trips or not? So the reality is he may not like it, but he may have to wait a little bit longer. So the question is, is that 12-month or 18-month window, what's, what feels most comfortable to this board? Uh, but, you know, a shorter time frame may help the little guy on the back end. That way he doesn't have to wait as long. But... Um, you know, the other thing you could do is, you know, the second guy in, you know, there, there could be a specific criteria that you may want to say, as long as you, he doesn't generate more than uh, 10 trips more than, than the 100, then we're going to allow him to go. But you know, that has a cumulative effect because what happens to the second guy after that, he's only going to do 10, and then, then all of a sudden you have a bunch of properties that want to kind of keep going through that. So you got to you got to take the kind of the good with the bad, but the overall is what your, your overall goal was to make sure that that we have enough infrastructure and looking at uh, deficiencies uh, holistically. And again, uh, the good thing about this uh, ordinance, I think, with with the time factor, it, it does allow people to wait it out if they have to. Um, but with uh, everything else, isn't there appeal process? For, um, in a rezoning standpoint, I don't know if there is a re, re, appeal oh, process. The TIA, they couldn't appeal. Maybe it, no. Okay. I'm not. I'm not sure what you're pe appealing. The other thing is you got to understand also in traffic mitigations, which was you know what you saw tonight with the school system. There was, there could be a a whole host of things identified, uh, and then you as a board, uh, depending on what the offerings were going to be, could decide whether that. It, uh, met the litmus test of them. Have they taken care of their impacts? And certainly if a small developer came in and there may have been a whole host of things identified, I think you, you would use your, uh, you know, uh, decision making whether, whether in your minds they've, they've offered enough improvements to take care of the, of the deficiencies. So I think there's some latitude there from uh, giving you some discretion as you're, as you're looking at traffic impacts. Is there any opportunity for a reach back? And what I'm talking about is um, Mr. 85 peak hour trip developer, if somebody comes in with 20 peak hours within the next 18 months and there are traffic mitigations, you're going to be on hook for your share of them. And that's a zoning condition. Mm -hmm. You don't like that one at all. Yeah, do yeah. yeah. I don't like that's, it much either. I don't like the best. I don't like it at all either because it's very hard to enforce, but yeah. it kind of gets to 
This is a real, um, another one of those types of applications where there could be unintended consequences. You know, that's things that you're kind of, kind of wrestling with now. Um, I, I think you just have to make in, in some perspective in your minds is the holistic good of, of a new ordinance that has a, a cumulative effect factor put into it. Is it better holistically or do we go back to what we've been doing now and just looking at it piecemeal and and saying that's maybe as good as it gets. So um, I still think we're making progress and I still think we need to address this issue. And um, I suggest that if we simply say if two out of the three things were one, if it goes, if it trips the hundred dollar, hundred peak trip two, if it was in the 400 feet or three, it was in the last 12 to 18 months. So if you get two out of those threes, bing, then you got to do a traffic study. Because so, I don't want to not do this because we really need this. So, <laughs> well, well, if we use the 400 feet, if it's not within 400 feet, how far is it? I oh, mean, well, I see what you're saying. I'm just saying, which is something. Yeah, I think kind of some of those standards are, pr are pretty, you know, you have to have a three legged stool. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know if you can necessarily say two out of the three. I Okay. I, I guess those are some things that we grasp with too. Is there, I mean, is there, is there other elements that we could include in there to, to, to allow you to have a little bit more flexibility? I, I think you may, may want to just say that, you know, anything that that's 10 trips or less or maybe or whatever that, that magic number is that you feel comfortable with is if that next guy in doesn't go more than 10, 10% 10 or 20% or whatever it is. Percentages is a good thing. I mean, I, I mean that, that'd be something that you could do, but then but then you've you've got to extend that to the next guy that comes in. The third guy is or, okay, but again, to be honest with you, you know, 10, 10 trips, twenty trips, you know, over a period of time is really in, in the scheme of of deficiency in a system is really not a lot. It, you know, you got to keep it in perspective. You know, you start getting deficiencies when you start getting up to you know hundred trips, two hundred trips, so. Um, the small stuff I really wouldn't worry about. So that, that's certainly something you could, you could think about and, you know, if, if you wanted staff to go back and um, maybe take another look and see is if you feel like compelled that we need to have maybe a, another uh, trigger for the second person in or third person in, whatever, to look at that and give you a little bit more feel we could do it, we could look at that. And so, uh, but we would, we would appreciate any any uh, discussion or feedback you can give staff to where where your comfort level is if, if you choose to go that that way that way we're not we're not guessing and and meeting up here next time deciding you know more importantly what is what's the right feel factor so I, I think what you're hearing is we still have some heartburn on this one yeah and the only way we can sound out counsel on this is to forward it to them they can't have input into some of these they can send it parameters. Well, I th yeah, I think I yep. think your goal is to uh, to get it uh, as a recommendation that you feel is 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 in your minds a an, appro an approvable manner, and it and it represents the community values going forward. And then again, it's not to say that they won't tweak that that language or or offer some different different things. I just don't know, not aware of there's a collaborative process between P and Z board and council where you could. You could hash out some terms. I'm not sure I'm, I want to go to the town council and report a half-baked goose and yeah. have them come back and say, why is it that the PNZ didn't do their job? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how polished it has to be, but it sounds like very polished before it goes. Well, I think it need, needs to be better than let's throw it over the fence. Not a work in progress. In, in prior years when we've done things like this, um, I don't know if we're still allowed to do this, but we have taken separate votes on these items. And what that would allow us to do is to say vote um, on item D separately. If there's a no vote, then you get to explain to the council what the issues were and they can. Well, I, I think we have or the opportunity have to, all together. to vote on all of the other things other than D. And then I think we have the opportunity to send D back to staff and say maybe we want to wrestle with it in another work session. I mean we can vote on everything but D. Okay. Yeah. Tonight. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm are you guys willing to go after this or do you want us to Well I think if you if, if I mean if you if you have in your minds tonight that there's a certain element that that you wanted to go forward with that, that have council consider, you know, 
we can do that. If not, we go back to the table based on whatever feedback you are, have and try to try to polish this more into what your what your values are tonight. Uh, I don't think there's a magic time frame for any of this, but um, well, if we voted on this tonight and sent it to council. What I'm going to report to council is we voted on it, but we had a huge amount of heartburn. So that, that's a valid way issue. to do it as well. Yeah. Um, just from sitting over there, I think what I'm hearing um, somewhat collectively from you all is, again, this concern about the little guy. And I think we could write um, and staff between now and when this goes to council could add sort of a fourth. So, you know, right now we kind of have the three triggers and as uh, Mr. Jensen said, we could add a fourth. Um, that said, but if your trips are some minimum number, then you don't have to do the TIA. So that would take care of that situation, which I heard several of you talk about. So I think, you know, we could certainly write that um, and send it to council without having to have any more back and forth, if that's kind of what you all felt comfortable with. And then we'd just be looking for, do you think it's, you know, and I just thought, is it 10%? Mm -hmm. Is it if they're not generating, you know, 10 peak hour trips or more, they don't have to do a TIA? Or you could say, you know, 20. Um, or, you know, or, or if you're not sure, you know, staff could sit and think about it a little more and then at council we could tell them, well, we think it's 10 or we think it's 20. Um, so I think we could get pretty close if that was sort of the major concern folks were having. Um, and we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have to delay. I mean, it, it gets complicated when we're taking parts of round 30 in five different council meetings, you know. So There's just, a risk here and that is, and this risk is a little lower now that Ms. Adcock is gone, but um, there's a risk here that you take it to council and the council, I have to report on the council that, by the way, we didn't vote on this particular stipulation of what you're saying. And there's a couple of people in council, well, wait a second, you know, we wanted P and Z to, to look at what we're looking at and they sent it right back to us. Well, and I think at this point we're asking you to vote again on the concept. So if you like this concept of adding the fourth um, leg to the stool or the fourth trigger, then I think you could report to council. Yes, we all supported, you know, the majority supported that concept. Staff worked out some details, <clears throat> but we were in support of the concept. So, you know, it, it gives you a little bit more. And at this point, I would really like to get staff's input. They're the experts here. You know, we're the concept people. We see some issues going, but whether it's 10% or 10. 12%, I mean, the transportation guys are, I, I would be more than happy to hear what they think about this you know you're the expert not us we just know that know we're seeing like problems i'm not sure you like my number um you know uh, you know 10 percent seems seems like a, a a reasonable number and i mean let me give you some equation you know a, 10 peak hour trips is equivalent to 10 extra houses mm -hmm. you know and if you look at the the you know the performa for 10 houses i mean that's that's not a small development by any means they're making you know that's a pretty pretty sizable investment for someone to go in and do. So, you know, if, if 10 homes feels like a, um, a good a good number to you all, that, that would represent a 10% you know, increase in, in, in peak hour trips, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 10 out of 100. So if that's something that, that feels good, again, just look at it in context, you know, one peak hour trip is, is about equal to one dwelling unit, so. So put a stake in the sand, let's say 10. Because 10%, I think it's the same thing when you're dealing with 100. So why would you just say 10 and keep it simple? Because then you go 10% of what? No, I, 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 think, I, think, I think a specific number is, is specific easier. There's no exactly. doubt about what it is, right? Yes, exactly. Just uh -huh. yeah, put a number out there yeah. and then just put a stake in the stand and that's what we... Would, would you be okay with a number like 10, but giving the planning director discretion to move that a little bit left or right based upon the circumstance? I don't... I don't know, but that's, I think that's probably some other legislation. Yeah. We need to have specific standards, um, unless it was going to be an automatic where, where it was 10 or if it was 10% of 10, so one either way. Um, at that point, if we, we do a standard like that, the planning director essentially has to grant that waiver. It's, to be a dis planning director at a staff level can't make a truly discretionary decision. That's left for counsel and quasi-judicial hearings. That's why we have so many quasi-judicial hearings. So he would either have to automatically grant the 10% on either side, which would then lower your number to nine or effectively raise your number to 11 instead of 10, um, or we'd have to put some standards, uh, specific standards in place for when he can make that decision. So that just makes things a lot more complicated. 
plant. How do you feel? Do you want to vote on everything but this one, mm. and then come back and do a separate motion on this Tonight. one so we can break? Out the discussion at the town council meeting. Mm -hmm. Sounds fine. Tonight. So I would really like to accept <coughs> a motion on items B, C, E, F, G, and H. These are LDO amendments. And you are going to bring up some of the comments. We oh, yes, yes, so, yes Gallivan. I'm looking for the right place on here. Uh, I'll make a motion. Uh, I move that the board forward LDO amendment oops, uh, round 30B. Um, say those numbers, letters again, Al. B. Okay, I think it was B, C, E, F, G, and H. Yes, those those letters to town council with a recommendation for approval as it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans and is reasonable in the public interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and presentation. Before you, yes. okay, but you will make comments that we said here to them, even though it's approved, right? Say again. The comment I made about B with the 500 feet from that school, you'll still put that in your comments? Well, we, are you offering a friendly amendment to the motion? I'm hoping it's not necessary. I'm asking if you're just going to make any comments. <laughs> I just uh, wanted, it, okay. It's in my notes. So you, Perfect. That's all you I can wanted. bet I'm going to talk to it. But Thank if you. you wanted to, no, I do not me want to, to make pass, any more complicated. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second. Yeah. Okay. We fine. have a motion and we have a second. We're seconded, Nancy. <laughs> Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion. Opposed. You're opposed? I am opposed. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't give you a chance to. <coughs> Would you like to say why you're opposed now? Much ado about nothing. I've said it before. I think we're, this is art and science here, and we're getting too much into art. Okay, is your opposition on the. I'm trying to, because I have to report on it. Well, now. I, I, it almost seemed to me that 10% would make some of us happy. I don't know whether it'd make all of us happy. But now we're junking the whole section D. No, we're not junking it. We're going to take a separate vote. Yeah, we didn't vote on In D order to, this to, one. To, to, to report on our issues, I wanted to have oh, a vote maybe on the I've, we Maybe planning. I've misunderstood that. So we're going to come back and look at D with whatever makes us happy? Yes. Right now. Okay. We're going to do a separate motion okay. on that. Is, is now that he's voted, it, can he change his vote? Or no. it's probably not. We'll, we'll leave it eight to leave one. Leave it. Leave it eight to one. Man just wasn't fully aware of what was going well, on. Well, the only reason is it could stay in consent if it was unanimous. But yeah. So it's not in consent. Sorry. Um, so now. Do we want to try a motion on item D, traffic impact analysis? Is that with a mod to allow that for um, if, if someone wants to do a motion with a modification, I think that's great. All right, I'll take a shot at it. Good. I move the board forward uh, LDO amendment 30-D. D. The town council with a recommendation for approval and I don't know where the mod would get inserted, as it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans, is reasonable and in the public interest for the reasons set forth in the staff report and presentation with the following modification, that we add a lower, help me out with this, that we add a lower limit of 10 peak trips per hour that would not trigger a traffic impact analysis regardless of the cumulative effect. That. Perfect. I will second. We have a motion and a second. That was Mona, Mark and Mona. Mark and Mona. Uh -huh. And may I amend to add that they consider the use of the land when considering what peak hour is? Say again. May I amend to say that they also consider the use of the land when considering peak hours? using my example of schools being mid-afternoon. 
Uh, I think you just threw a wrench in the works. Okay, so I may not amend it. That's fine. <laughs> I'm asking. I don't know. Well, Mr. Jensen, did we, no, we, are, we already consider land use when we when we look at trip, trip generation. Oh. We already consider that. To be different hours? Huh? To be different hours? So, well, in, in generally, uh, we will we will look at whatever the, the, the peak hour of the generator and the adjacent street is. So, but you'll find, uh, particularly in most school settings, in the afternoon when school gets out anywhere between two and four, that there's still not as much traffic along the the major street combined with that school traffic to, to make it the, the peak the, the quote peak number of trips coming through that corridor in an hour. That's why we do it at the end of the day or towards the regular five o'clock time. Come drive with me sometime. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, fine. So we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? All those in favor of the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. It, it, it just strikes me. It, wouldn't it be interesting if that one stayed on consent and I never got a chance to say anything? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, then I say no, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, but that, um, and I believe that completes our agenda. We have no new or old business, so um, I'd take a motion to adjourn. So move. Buck, so motions move. that we adjourn. I'll second. And we have a second. Ryan, discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries unanimously. You're 10 minutes off market. <laughs> oh, yeah. Carrie TV. Visit the Town of Carrie website at townofcarrie.org.